may be seated. investigation with regard to each defendant and the sentencing memos provided. With regard to, to defendant uh, Mrs. Crumley, have the prosecutor, Ms. Smith, and defendant Mrs. Crumley had the opportunity to read and discuss the pre-sentence report. I have had the opportunity to discuss it with my client, and we do have uh, a few objections. Okay. You're, you're There's getting, one correction. You're getting at me. Sorry. All right. It's, it's uh, a little unwieldy with um, everyone here, but I just want to make sure that you went over the pre-sentence report. The prosecutor has had that opportunity as well. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. And with regard to defendant Mr. Crumley, have the prosecutor, Ms. Lehman, and the defendant Mr. Crumley had the opportunity to read and discuss the pre-sentence report. Good morning, Your Honor. I have had the opportunity to review the pre-sentence investigation with Mr. Crumley. All right. And then with regard to uh, defendant Mrs. Crumley, um, do you have any corrections, deletions, or additions on both the prosecutor as well as defense counsel? But you, you may go ahead. Thank you. Um, the only correction we would have, Your Honor, is that actually on the very front face sheet, it indicates that uh, Ethan Crumbly is a co-defendant, and I would ask that he be uh, taken off in that regard. Well, he's not... Um, I, I think probation has um, addressed, I've discussed this with probation. Um, Ms. Wheeler, um, what is your suggestion with regard to the pre-sentence investigation? He, he clearly is not a co-defendant. That's correct. And in the PSI, he's listed as a related defendant, which is the best um, phrase we could come up with. But I'm comfortable if we want to move that to a condition 9.01. Okay. Um, and then it wouldn't list him as a co-defendant, but it was still um, requesting that contact order. Okay. Are, are you each satisfied with that? He's a related defendant, correct? I'm satisfied with that, but I would ask the court to hear our objection as to the no contact provision later. Um, sure. Thank sure. you. All right. Um, no other corrections, deletions, or additions, correct? Correct. All right. Not for Mrs. Crumley. Thank you. All right. Um, prosecutor, with regard to the pre sentence investigation, with regard to Jennifer Crumley, are there, are there any corrections, deletions, or additions to the pre sentence investigation? No, yes. Thank you. All right. Um, and with regard to Mr. Crumley, are there any corrections, deletions, or additions to the pre-sentence investigation? Yes, Your Honor, there are some corrections. Again, on the cover sheet, it does, the cover sheet of the PSI report does indicate that Mr. Crumley's son is a co-defendant. I understand that that's going to be changed. Um, Correct. We're satisfied with that. Also, on page one um, of the pre-sentence investigation report, there's an indication that Mr. Crumley has a substance abuse history. Um, he indicated during the pre-sentence investigation that he, he has used substances, alcohol, marijuana, but they, not a substance abuse history. So we would ask that um, the PSI report reflects that Mr. Crumley does not have a substance abuse history. It's just simply a box check. Yes, Your Honor. Well, I guess I'm going to ask probation to um, indicate uh, why they checked that box. But from what I read, he indicated that he used marijuana daily, and I didn't read that he was any medical purpose. Um, there's also some su uh, support for large volumes of uh, vodka and whiskey being purchased in a one month period, so. Your Honor, I am so sorry if I may. Um, I did not realize it says yes in the box for Mrs. Crumbly with regard to alcohol use. 
I didn't know we were going to get into the substance, but those purchases were all made in November, right before Thanksgiving, right before the Crumblies hosted extended family and people for the holidays. So to use those receipts that the prosecution attached in their memo that were not even part of trial um, is, is unfair. And my client also denies having an alcohol abuse history. Well, they weren't part of the trial because I excluded them. Right. They no, no, no. Well, the alcohol purchases, I, you had excluded the photographs with the, with the alcohol bottles. I believe two years ago there was a request by the prosecution to introduce evidence that the Crumleys had made large volumes of purchases at a liquor store close to their home. Um, and I don't think at the time the prosecutor was able to link those price store purchases um, to alcohol. So at that time, two years ago, um, I, I believe I excluded that at that time. But I'm going to allow uh, the prosecution as, as well as probation uh, to address that. Just uh, the last comment from the court judge, that's correct. I think it was June of 2022. So regarding the, the purchases themselves, counsel put in photographs of that Thanksgiving dinner. There were six people there. The evidence supported by the prosecution shows 18 different bottles of whiskey and vodka over a, a 26 day period, Judge. It's, it's factual by a preponderance of the evidence that occurred. I believe probation can better articulate the reason why the box substance abuse was checked, but it appears just from the, the factual information that's why it was checked yesterday. Uh, Ms. Wheeler, would you like to address uh, that? Um, Judge, I agree with Mr. Keith. The alcohol purchases were not put into the PSI because we were not aware of those at the time the PSI was prepared. Um, I believe with Mr. Crumley, he reported daily marijuana use without the, um, without the use of a bottle of marijuana card. Um, and in addition, and Mrs. Crumley's use is outlined in the narrative, and I think that that justifies uh, substance use experience. Your Honor, I would object to <coughs> substance abuse I mean, substance abuse was in high school, and there certainly is not drug abuse. So she's listed as yes for drug abuse, yes for alcohol abuse, and yes for substance abuse. We would be objecting to all three, but there's the probation department hasn't even said anything with respect to Mrs. Crumley and drug abuse. Um, would you agree that drug use should be stricken? Judge, it says that uh, she first tried marijuana at age of 16 and alcohol at 19, used marijuana occasionally until 2020. Okay, well, occasionally. I don't, does it sound like drug, drug abuse? Sure, Judge. I mean, for some people, I guess. So I'm going to strike drug abuse as it relates to Mrs. Crumley, um, but uh, keep substance abuse and alcohol abuse as to, as to both um, in the pre-sentence investigation. All right? So what else? Um, yes, Your Honor. Also, and this is a little different here, Your Honor, but on pages 2 and 3 of the basic information report, it lists the sentencing date as April 9, 2024 at 12 a.m., obviously. Um, the court is not open at 12 a.m. We would just ask for Well, I would tonight. be if I could. Okay. I know you would. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, That's a computer issue, yeah. right? I don't sure. actually think we can correct that at this point. It's okay. Computer program. Sure. Um, Your Honor, in Mr. Crumley's criminal history, each offense lists an arrest date. Mr. Crumley maintains that he has been arrested twice, including for the instant offenses. Specifically, record seven of eight of Mr. Crumley's criminal history in the um, pre-sentence investigation report indicates that Mr. Crumley was arrested on August 29th of 2017 by the Oakland County Sheriff's Office for failing to display a valid license. Um, I did review the 53 district court register of actions online, um, and in fact, it indicates that the citation was dismissed on August 29th of 2017, that the citation was issued on August 9th of 2017. So I would ask that the Record seven of eight correct that Mr. Crumbly was arrested on August 29th of 2017. That's not accurate. Probation. I don't have an objection to striking that, um, but we do often put in district court arraignment dates under arrest date. Okay. That helps us when we score PRB six going forward to as at time events. But I don't have an objection to taking that. All right. So the arrest date. Um, Ms. Layman is August 9th, 2017. That's what you want. When the citation was issued, right? Okay. Correct. All right. Um, as it relates to substance use, Your Honor, and I, I should have said this a few minutes ago, in the PSI report, it indicates that Mr. Crumbly was using alcohol and marijuana from 1997 to 2021, but that's not accurate. Um, during the pre-sentence interview, Mr. Crumbly was asked when he first used alcohol and marijuana, and he indicated okay. it was 1997. So I would just ask for a correction that it wasn't used that whole time, um, that it was a first use, and that it was, um, and then Mr. Crumbly 
uh, first used marijuana at 21, then not again until it became legal in Michigan, I believe is what the indication was during the pre-sentence investigation. Ms. Wheeler, I believe he told you he, he was experiencing daily use at the time of the offense. That's correct, correct, until the fall of 2021. It's a bit hard to explain that in the chart because it only asked for a start date and end date, but I can try to explain that a little better in the narrative. All right, I appreciate that. We appreciate that. Thank you, Your Honor. And the last one, on pages 33 and 34, um, there were statements alleged to have been made by Mr. Crumley to a therapist on March 18th of 2024. I did speak with Mr. Crumley regarding those alleged statements that were included in the pre-sentence investigation report, and he denies making the statements that he was experiencing sadness, depression, anxiety attacks, or any of the symptoms listed in the report. Um, the interview was conducted by video, Your Honor, it was a, a video call, so there was significant difficulty in communicating, but I would ask that those statements be stricken as Mr. Crumley indicates that they were not said. I have no further questions at the day, Ms. Wheeler, any comment on that? Judge, they are in the mental health records. I could put in a statement that um, Mr. Crumley disputes this in the narrative and then explain that there were discussions of communication during the video visit. Are you satisfied with that? I'm Ms. sorry, Mark? Are you satisfied with Ms. Wheeler's suggestion? I, I didn't hear the whole thing. Sorry, well, it's probably because I was coughing. But, uh, uh, they are in the mental health records, but I could put a statement in there that Mr. Crumbly disputes this at the time of sentencing and then without an explanation. That would be great. Thank but, you. Prosecutor, any comment? No doubt. All right. So there are no other corrections, deletions, or additions. Is that correct? Correct, Your Honor. There are a number of objections. I believe uh, Ms. Smith also has some, but corrections, additions, deletions, that's it. All right. Um, I want to um, point out that each defendant has a right to and will receive an individualized sentencing in this matter. Um, I want to confirm, because the victims um, impacted are the same, the court felt it would be uh, in the best interest of the victims, the defendants, and also judicially efficient to hear all the victim impact statements at the same time. Um, I want to be sure that neither defendant has any objection to that. No, Your Honor, that's fine. Thank you. No objection, Your Honor. All right. Um, what else about the pre-sentence investigation? Who would you like to go first, Your Honor? Um, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, Your Honor, we would object to the narrative summary as written by probation and also the agent's description of offense. It's very obvious that probation did not sit through trial and hear all of the evidence that came out at trial. For sure. There is a number of mistakes, and it is so biased that I just would I would just make sure that ask the court to ask them to. Um, there are so many mistakes. I mean, I could be on the record for ten minutes going on with that, but the narrative is just not accurate. So I would ask the court to keep that in mind and make a note of that. It's information gleaned from the police report. That's how a pre-sentence investigation is normally done. I don't think anyone here, to my knowledge, has a copy of the transcript of either trial. My understanding is ordering that is about $35,000, right? Yeah. I don't think anyone, the probation, of course, has not seen a trial transcript, and in any sentencing, they haven't seen a trial transcript. Right? I do agree with you that the agent's description of offense is from the police reports and mm -hmm. documents along those lines. However, the narrative summary of what was proven at trial, identifying five things against Mrs. Crumbly, is simply inaccurate. That those five things are pointed out in my memo. I explain each of those. If the court does not need me to make a record, I won't. But if the court does, well, that that's up to you. I, it's that's in the record you. in terms of the sentencing memo. Okay. I'll I'll just give like one example. They're saying that as the fifth reason, um, she should be considered to have committed illegal acts is because she was. Let me get the right words. She was rarely home. That in itself is not a crime. That in itself is not illegal. The the information put in that report is not accurate. It I wasn't agree with you. The same could be said about me. The same me. Me too. Me too. Okay. So I agree with you. But I, I guess I guess where we're getting our wires crossed here is that Miss Wheeler and in every um, pre sentence investigation, probation uh, takes information from the police report. Like Ms. Wheeler didn't make it up herself, and she of course did not have the benefit of the trial transcript either. Also, the trial transcript does not um, include all of the information ever uh, by necessity of the rules of evidence, right? I, 
understand the only mm -hmm. reason I bring it to the court's attention and make the objection is because this is a document that will follow Mrs. Crumbly and it's important that it's accurate. That's so I just want to make the objections for the record. All right. All right, what else? What what else um, from you, Ms. Smith? Um did you want me to go into the objections on the scoring and the objection on the no contact order or would you like to first I believe that Sister has a similar <laughs> argument regarding the narrative summary and agent's description in her PSI as well, as well. Would you like to address that before the sentencing guidelines or? I can, Your Honor, if you'd like. I did, again, um, I did submit the sentencing memorandum, which does more fully outline what my objections are. However, Your Honor, in reviewing the, um, the over 14 page narrative that was provided to the court in the PSI report, it's obvious that that was, it, it at least appears to myself, Your Honor, that that narrative was mostly written after Jennifer Crumley's trial. Um, it was not written after James Crumley's trial. It contains mostly information um, regarding, or uh, information uh, found in the police reports, in, in various witness statements, and information from the prosecutor's office, it appears. And I'm objecting to it because it is not specific to Mr. Crumbly. It's not accurate. It contains information that was not admitted at trial. It contains information that was not evidenced during Mr. Crumbly's trial and shouldn't be held against him for the purposes of sentencing. Well, I, I guess I agree with you. Um, Ms. Wheeler is always very thorough, and um, I'm not surprised that there's a 14-page narrative. Uh, that information was taken from the police report, and um, I'm aware of that. Or I believe that the Department of Corrections always does it in that way. I don't think that there's anyone here, I could be wrong, who has read a trial transcript. I, I don't know, maybe someone has excerpts of it, but the, the trial transcript will take a very long time. Um, the the pre-sentence investigation is never based on the trial transcript. So I, I suppose it would be appropriate uh, to include in the pre-sentence investigation that the narrative in the pre-sentence investigation is based on the police reports submitted in this manner, which are numerous, correct, from many different agencies. That's correct, Your Honor. Do you have any objection to that? No, Judge, just, just one comment as far as the PSI. This court indicated every single PSI utilizes the police report and other information to compile the narrative information. Correct. The, the court sat to the trial. The court can make the appropriate record when the sentence is handed down. The jury found these facts to be true. I dispute the characterization that the, the PSI is real with inaccuracy. I believe it to be accurate. And this week, obviously, reviewed all the cell phone records, and those were included. Judge, you made certain rulings throughout the pendency of this trial, as you alluded to earlier. You have all the information. It's, it's readily available to you. Nothing needs to be extracted from the summary. I have no objection to a statement in the PSI indicating that Ms. Wheeler drew information from the narrative of police reports. That's fine. Like I said, it happens in every single case. But I do dispute the characterization, but I understand the court is going to issue the sentencing individual to the offense and the offender based upon the record. Correct. Correct. So we, we'll add that. We'll add that. Thank you, Your Honor. It does, in the report, it does indicate um, a number of reports that Ms. Wheeler relied on in writing the narrative, and then it says, and other evidence. Um, and again, some of the things that are listed in the narrative were not evidence in James Crumley's trial, specifically the over 2,000 pages of text messages or messages between Mr. and Mrs. Crumley, in addition to other messages between Mrs. Crumley and her son and things of that nature. So I'm asking for those corrections. We could use a different word. We could use a different word. And Judge, again, as the court has stated, it's the same police reports that are used for each. Um, and I do believe it's very clear in the PSI that they are conversations between Mrs. Crumbly and someone else. It certainly doesn't say Mr. Crumbly. That's correct, Your Honor. I'm just ensuring <laughs> Mr. Crumbly's PSI is specific to Mr. Crumbly. I understand. And that the court is considering that. That's why I'm asking, making the objections I'm making, Your Honor. All right. I appreciate that. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. What else? Any Anything else about uh, the pre-sentence investigation? With, um, besides the sentencing guidelines, right? Aside from the sentencing guidelines, the other objection relates to the no contact provision proposed between Mrs. Crumbly and Mr. Crumbly, and I'm arguing on behalf of Mrs. Crumbly, obviously, and between Mrs. Crumbly and Ethan Crumbly. This is a family. They have a, despite even having felonies on their records, they have a constitutional right to be a family 
unless the prosecution can articulate a reason that is valid and surpasses a certain standard to allow, to disrupt the family from being able to have contact with one another. Um, let me give you some information that I, I didn't previous, previously have. I've consulted with the probation department, the Michigan Department of Corrections. They have indicated to me that um, if Mr. Crumley and the shooter are in prison, uh, the Michigan Department of Corrections will categorize them as enemies. Um, and I put that in quotes. The reason being that they will not, it'd be like two brothers or, or someone like that. They will not, they're characterized in that way, so they will not be housed in the same facility. Um, so there is that factor. I, I think um, the other difficulty um, I'm having is that um, I got your pre uh, your sentencing memo at about 4:32 on Friday, and Ms. Lehman's I got, I got over the weekend, so the prosecutor didn't have a, a chance to respond to that. So I, I'm not clear if, if there's uh, I guess I'm going to ask if there's any objection or if there would if you'd like to file uh, file something supplementally. I, I honestly never faced this issue. So, I, I don't know. I can just respond. My only response to this is that we're asking that these defendants be treated like any other defendant okay. in the Michigan Department of Corrections. Right. And it's my information that because they are co-defendants, the no contact will be in place. And because the, the shooter is, is a related defendant, no contact will be continued. Again, I Okay, you just mentioned two different issues. Because they're co-defendants, they're, they're a man and a woman anyway, right? right. So they would, if, if they go to the Michigan Department of Corrections, they would not be in the same facility. Correct. Um, Co-defendants are, are traditionally not housed together. There's that issue. She's asking about a no contact order between Mr. and Mrs. and the shooter. So I, I don't know what your position is on that or if you have any legal authority to support your position. If you want to respond to it later, I have frankly never um, faced this issue. So. Well, yeah, that's... Probably true, Judge, and, and as the court indicated, this, this was uh, um, objections made recently. I don't have anything as of ready as far as legal authority regarding that. My information is only from Michigan Department of Corrections, and the reason why they put the no contact in place, and that is because of the nature of this crime and the fact that they are related to defendants. Again, we're not asking for any special treatment one way or the other. We just want whatever the Michigan Department of Corrections would do in any other case. All right, well, would you like to respond, Ms. Wheeler? I think you are the one who told me about the enemy status, in, in quotes, that would be maintained. Yes, Judge, and there's certainly no guidebook for this situation again. Uh, those I are my thoughts on was. why I recommended um, the no contact order, but certainly the court can issue what they want. It was just my thoughts. Do you, do you, yeah. Would you like to um, respond? If not, I don't see a reason to have a no contact order. Um, at the moment, if, if the Michigan Department of Corrections was able to tell me the reason to have no contact order, I would, I would consider it. I know we haven't had a chance to respond, but I, at the moment, I can't think of a reason for a no contact order. If, if, they're, if the three of them are all in the Michigan Department of Corrections, it would then be up to the Michigan Department of Corrections. But should I be ordering that right now is what I'm asking. Is there legal authority for me to do it? The options are lifting the no contact order or allowing you to research further. You just don't want the sentencing to be judge, judge. It's Me neither. I'm not adjourning the sentencing. In that case, judge, could the court hold this in advance so we can respond? Yes. That would be, yes. that would match my preference. All right, I'm going to do that, all right? Because I don't really have a chance to respond to that. Just the issue of whether or not the three of them would have no contact the, uh, I, I think you're, if, if, all, if all three of them were in the Michigan Department of Corrections or if one of them was somewhere else at, at some given time, is there a, a allowed to be contact either by letter or phone or visit? That's what you're asking about. Yes, that's what okay. we're asking about. All right. But we obviously, if Michigan Department of Corrections is overseeing or if they're in a facility, there's rules they have to follow, and this court doesn't order all of the rules that have to be followed. Oh, I, I agree. So, that's up to the Michigan Department of Corrections. So yeah. the court um, obviously will give the prosecution time to file a supplemental response. We filed our response rather quickly because we were given the PSI last week. We were given the prosecutor's uh, memo on Wednesday. And I mean, obviously, we got it. I got it late Friday, but there wasn't much time. I would
would also like an opportunity to either respond to their argument or to be able to brief the issue first, if the court would like, because it's my objection, more fully than I have been able to in here. You may. You may. It's not something I've dealt with. Okay. I guess I'm just asking what time frame the court would like or... How long would the prosecution like to respond? A week's time, Judge. Okay. So you are going to file something by April 16th, and then would you like until the 23rd of April to respond? That would be great. Thank you. I mean, they might do some research and find out there's no basis for it. I don't know. And, Judge, I will look further into that and also provide the information. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Judge, I'll communicate with the court and then send out some information. Thank you. Your Honor, just for the record, I'm just placing my objections in the no-contact order for the reasons stated in my sentencing memorandum. I will also file a reply brief on that. All right. Thank you. All right. What else? Your Honor, the remainder of the objections for Mrs. Crumley are based on guidelines. All right. Sure. Would the court like me to... Sure. Okay. Your Honor, Mrs. Crumley is objecting to the scoring of defense variables 7, 9, and 13, all based largely on the same reasoning. And so those defense variables are scored the way they are proposed by the Michigan Department of Corrections based on the number of deaths that resulted and based on the number of persons injured. And the problem with it is that Mrs. Crumley was found guilty of completing an act of gross negligence or failing to adhere to a legal duty. But when the shooter got the gun and made the decision to shoot multiple people, that took any and all culpability for the number of victims and put it in his hands. So the shooter, if he had gone out and shot one person, which if it's reasonably foreseeable he would hurt anyone, okay, one person might be reasonably foreseeable, the guidelines would be scored far differently. And just as a matter of course, the guidelines don't take into account a situation like this, much like much of the law in this case has been novel and new. So we would ask the court to score those guidelines at zero points because... Can you be specific about which we need to take each guideline individually? It's important for the record. Sure. Okay, so prior record variable seven gets scored when there are two or more offenses that the defendant is convicted on. And the objection in this case is that the conviction is based on there being four deaths. The conviction is not based on Mrs. Crumbly committing four acts of gross negligence. And this is a case where we have an intervening factor. We have an adult who was charged as an adult, sentenced as an adult to life without parole, who took everything out of Mrs. Crumbly's hands and made decisions himself. So to charge Mrs. Crumbly, hold it against her that there are four deaths, that part of it was not reasonably foreseeable to Mrs. Crumbly. Didn't the jury disagree with that? No, the jury found that there was... The jury did not find four different ways to say that there was gross negligence. The scoring is based on the number of deaths. At the end of the day, the shooter could have gone and shot one person or four people or 100 people. The problem is that even if it's foreseeable that something was going to happen, when the shooter intervened and made the decision what he was going to do as an adult that was convicted and held accountable for each of those four deaths and everyone injured, it came out of control from Mrs. Crumbly. So we object to the scoring that she committed for offenses. I agree with you, the jury entered four convictions, but the basis of it was four deaths. And it's not four acts by Mrs. Crumbly. This is a very unusual case. Well, if there were specifically four deaths intended, 
she would have been charged with homicide, right? Isn't that true? That would be true. Mm -hmm. But as with involuntary manslaughter, so if a person drives a car and ends up killing six people, there could be six counts, okay? But this situation is distinguishable because we have a different person who comes in as an adult, makes decisions, and takes any of what could be possible out of Mrs. Crumbly's hands. Okay, he, was, he wasn't an adult. He was charged as an adult. I, Isn't there a difference? Well, yeah, you're right. He, I'm saying, though, he was charged as an adult. Mm -hmm. He was held accountable for those crimes. Mm -hmm. He made the decision on how many people to shoot. He went in and made intentional choices. My point is just that Mr. Crumbly and Mrs. Crumbly, and I, I apologize because I'm arguing for Mrs. Crumbly, but sometimes I'll mention both. The decision on the impact of this case was absolutely not in their control. It was not foreseeable. <laughs> and, and that's the basis of the objection. Even if we, we respect the jury's verdict, they found that gross negligence took place. We, we respect that. That's fine. We get that. But at the end of the day, Mrs. Crumbly shouldn't be sentenced as if she controlled the fact that four people were murdered or if the shooter had shot 100 people. Um, that's, that's the objection, and this is a unique issue. It's a unique issue in that there is not case law, and it's, it's going to be a matter of first impression. Um, Ms. Lehman, do you want to weigh in on this uh, PRB 7? I would, Your Honor. I also am objecting to the scoring at 20 points. I do believe that the proper score is for zero for reasons similar to those that Ms. Smith stated. Um, this is not a case where there were four separate grossly negligent acts alleged. It was one grossly negligent act. And, and quite frankly, we don't have the jury here to ask them what they found or if they found that there were multiple grossly negligent acts. There were four counts for the four deaths of the students. And Your Honor, I understand that having these conversations, it, I, I'm not trying to be callous to anyone, Your Honor. I know. Um, but the, the four counts were for the, the four deaths that occurred, not for four separate criminal acts on behalf of James Crumbly. I understand what the jury's verdict was. I understand that, Your Honor. However, it's not as though um, a, 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 a similar situation, Your Honor, would be running, speeding through four different stop signs and causing four different um, motor vehicle accidents resulting in death. That would be something similar to a concurrent or a subsequent felony conviction. In this case, it is arguably one grossly negligent act that resulted in four deaths, and I'll obviously also multiple injuries and, and other issues as well, Your Honor. But my position is that this should not be scored at, PRG 7 should not be scored at 20 points because it is one act not multiple acts, and I don't believe that the sentencing guidelines properly um, consider the facts of this case. Again, we've never seen a case like this before, and I don't believe that the sentencing guidelines properly consider the facts of this case, Mr. Crumbly's case, or even Mrs. Crumbly's case, to adequately score PRB 7, and I believe it should be scored at zero. Um, I'm going to ask both the prosecutor and probation if you'd like to respond. Thank you, Judge. There is zero support for counsel's argument that PRB 7 should be scored at zero. The case law is clear. The statute is clear. There were four separate homicide counts. Four children were murdered on November 30, 2021. Because of that, each defendant was charged and then convicted of a homicide count, a voluntary manslaughter, each with its own elements. So we've argued back and forth about was this homicide or was it not. This is why the court issued the rulings the way the court did regarding the video and other evidence regarding photographs of what happened inside the school. The statute is extremely clear. Four separate counts. They don't get to have a scoring of zero as if three children weren't killed, Judge. It is clear what the law is. It has to be scored at 20 points. Um, anything further from probation? No, Judge. All right, well, I have reviewed this, uh, thoroughly the sentencing uh, memos that you uh, have submitted. Uh, as well as the pre-sentence investigation, um, the statute, and the case law. And I believe uh, Pierre B7 is scored correctly with regard to both defendants. Your Honor, the next objection um, that Mrs. Crumbly raises is on offense variable 9, which is the number of victims. This 
analysis is the same as the arguments I just made on prior record variable seven. Um, when the shooter came in and made the decision on the number of victims, it became not a reasonably foreseeable conclusion that he would do what he did. And that is why scoring that at 100 points for multiple deaths, these guidelines don't take into account this very unique situation where a person is dead, charged and convicted and sentenced as an adult made that decision. And it is, it violates due process and all of Mrs. Crumbly's constitutional rights to hold it against her that her son shot multiple people versus just one. So we would ask that that offense variable be scored at zero points. Slayman, do you want to play in that or? Yeah. I can, Your Honor, and, and that way the prosecution can respond once, Your Honor. All right, go ahead. Um, OB6, again, it scored at 10 points. Um, Are we talking about OB6 or OB9? I'm on OB6. OB. You said OB9 number of victims. I'm sorry. I can do OB9, Your Honor, if you'd like, and then go back to OB6. All right. I did, I went to OB9. I can do OB9, Your Honor. Okay, go ahead. Um, OB9, similar arguments to PRB7, Your Honor. Um, it was not Mr. Crumbly who pulled the trigger on the firearm that killed the four students, Your Honor. I, I, I'm making the same arguments. I don't think that I need to reiterate them, but I believe that it should be scored at zero. Thank you, Judge. Regarding offense variable nine, <coughs> the jury did find it was reasonably foreseeable. It's jury instruction 1615, 1618, 1610, Judge. Two juries, 24 individuals, 24 citizens found them guilty and found this act to be reasonably foreseeable. Had they not, they could have been found guilty. That's the law. Now, again, there is no justification for a scoring at zero. They are homicide offenses. Each is a separate count. The statute is clear. The case law is clear. We provide the supporting information and documentation in our sentencing memorandum. The scoring has to be 100 points. Anything else we have in addition? No, Judge, thank you. All right. Well, well I agree. I, I've spent, even before receiving any of your sentencing memos, I spent uh, an, an incredible amount of time um, going through all the guidelines, and I, I believe that OB9 is scored correctly to um, pursue it to the pre-sentence investigation, the statute, as well as the case law in this matter. All right. Your Honor, Mrs. Crumbly's next objection is to offense variable six, which is the offender's intent to kill or injure another individual. We would object to the scoring of this variable because Mrs. Crumbly did not have intent to kill or injure another individual, even if she was grossly negligent and obviously found guilty of gross negligence, that does not mean she intended to kill or injure another individual. We know who intended <coughs> to kill or injure another individual, and that's the shooter. He was held responsible, he was charged, he pled, he was held responsible, and, and we would object to the scoring of OB6. Okay, OB6 says, or there was gross negligence amounting to an unreasonable disregard for life, right? Or. I agree with you, but the problem is, is that, again, these sentencing guidelines don't take into account another person coming in and making those decisions. So if, if that's the problem, and that's what makes all of these guidelines not exactly fit with the circumstances of this case. You know, I, did you guys read, I sent you a case named Albers. Did you read that case? I thought that was interesting. 258 Mishap 578. There, I, I, I thought that was telling. There was a, you know, a number of victims in this apartment and someone, a fire, someone was a fire starter, a known fire starter, injured all kinds of people there. And um, I think that had more to do with OB3, but I, I thought that was a, a telling case. Uh, Ms. Lehman? The difference, Your Honor, in that case, though, is that there wasn't somebody who was charged as an adult that intervened and made the choice to hurt everyone in that apartment building. That's the difference in this case, is that Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly did what they did or didn't do, but when their son came in and made decisions, again, it took it out of their hands. And if he had made the decision to do something different with that weapon, we wouldn't be here with that scoring. That's, that's the difference. 
I don't think they, they were charged based on what he did with that, that weapon. They were charged on, with everything they did and didn't do up to the time that he used that weapon, right? What he did from the moment he started shooting is, is not really the crux. I agree with you, and that's why the problem is, is that because he got involved, the offenders in this case did not have any intent on their part, and so it just makes it very distinguishable from any other case of involuntary manslaughter. It complicates it enormously, and it really does become an issue for discussion um, in this case. Ms. Lehman. Yes, Your Honor. Um, for OB6, it's currently scored at 10 points. The defense, uh, Mr. Crumbly, requested it be scored at zero points. The prosecution asserted two separate theories during trial, um, mm -hmm. which were both read to the jury. We don't know which theory the jury relied on. If they all relied on the same theory, if they all relied on different theories, if half of them relied on one and half of them relied on the other. <coughs> Unfortunately, Your Honor, we don't know the answer to that. So the issue that we have is that there are two theories under which Mr. Crumbly could be convicted during trial. We know that he was convicted because we're here at sentencing. But neither of them takes into account the fact that there was no evidence presented that Mr. Crumbly was aware of what his son was planning. There's the, the guidelines, and specifically OB6 doesn't take into account that there was no evidence presented during the trial that Mr. Crumbly was not aware that his son had obtained access to, the, to any firearms in the home. And again, for these reasons, it's the intent. I understand that gross negligence is a part of the scoring ground. However, it's, it's disregard for human life. There was no evidence presented that James Crumbly had disregard for human life, whether it's believed he was grossly negligent or not, Your Honor. There was no evidence presented during trial. Again, notwithstanding the jury's verdict, I understand what the verdict was, Judge, but the guidelines themselves, the scoring, which is what we're doing right now, this is not retrying the case, this is just scoring the guidelines, and the guidelines themselves, Your Honor, do not take into account the specific facts of this case and the evidence that was presented during this case. So for those reasons, Your Honor, I'm asking that OB6 be put at zero on behalf of James Crumbly. Prosecution. Thank you, Judge. Um, in Jennifer Crumbly's memo, there was no objection to OB6. We did respond and articulate the reasons why. In James Crumbly's memo, I asked the court to take that argument from our memorandum into consideration regarding Jennifer Crumbly's case as well. First, I'd like to address the counsel's repeatedly calling this a case of first impression. This is a rare case. It's a unique case, but it's not a case of first impression. The legal duty of Michigan has been around for years, as has involuntary manslaughter and the law surrounding involuntary manslaughter. We actually cited Albers to the Court of Appeals as well as to this court in our response to the defendant's initial motion to quash in early 2022. Mm -hmm. That case is on, is on point, as is People v. Cole, which is cited and attached to our sentencing memorandum. The jury instruction is clear, 1618 and 1615, Judge, OB6, 10 points are scored when there was gross negligence amounting to an unreasonable disregard for life. Compare that to our jury instructions and the, the, the case in, in People v. Cole, where the Court of Appeals specifically said, acting in a grossly negligent manner where it was apparent that serious injury could result, implies that defendant Cole was acting with an unre unreasonable disregard for life. OB6 should be scored at 10 points. Anything additional confirmation? No, thank you. I believe OB6 is correctly scored. Your Honor, this is Crumbly's next objection, um, and again, this is along the same analysis as the prior objections, is to offense variable 13, the continuing pattern of criminal behavior. This case is scored based on there being four resulting murders and multiple injuries in this case. And again, this factor was ripped out of the hands of Mr. Crumbly when the shooter decided to make a continuing pattern of behavior and resulted in multiple harms and murders. Mrs. Crumbly did not exhibit a continuing pattern of criminal behavior. There were not four or multiple counts of gross negligence, um, and therefore we would just object to being scored at all. Yes, Your Honor. For OB 13 for Mr. Crumbly, a single felonious act cannot constitute a pattern. Um, People versus Carl, 322 Mishap 690, uh, is a court of appeals case which indicated that a 
defendant's multiple convictions for reckless driving causing death or serious impairment arose from his single act of driving recklessly. Um, he had passengers who were injured. There, were, there was at least one death that occurred. The Court of Appeals found that it was error to score OB-13, even though the driver of the car, um, who was the defendant, struck and killed uh, someone, and passengers in the defendant's car were seriously injured. So, Your Honor, this would be something similar. Um, this is arguably one act that resulted in four deaths. This is not four separate acts. Going back to my discussion, and, and I believe PRV-7, Your Honor, running four different stop signs. Those are four separate and distinct acts resulting in injuries or deaths. In this case, we don't have that. It is arguably one grossly negligent act that resulted in four deaths. And Your Honor, I'm not in any way trying to minimize that those students were killed, Your Honor, but in scoring the points, it's currently scored at 25 points for the four deaths and not four separate acts. Those four separate acts were committed by Mr. Crumbly's son based on, according to the jury, his one act of gross negligence. And again, we don't know what act the jury relied on. We don't know if they believe that there were multiple. We don't know, quite frankly, Your Honor. But there aren't four distinct acts, four separate acts of gross negligence that resulted in each of the four deaths of the students. Um, so again, Your Honor, for these reasons and the reasons that I stated in my memorandum, which I, and I do cite additional case law for the court, uh, I believe that OB 13 should be scored at 25 points on behalf of James Crumbly. Well, I did read the case law. I'm sorry, zero points, Your Honor. I, I did read the case law in your briefs, but there's more, I think there's some more recent case law provided by um, the prosecution in their brief. I don't know if it's Herman or Gibbs. Uh, do you want to respond? Yes, yeah, so briefly. Thank you. First of all, OB 13 does permit the court to score 25 points when the incident occurred on one day. There was substantial evidence presented to the jury to show this was not one isolated act. Gross negligence occurred over a, a period of time. There was absolutely a pattern of gross negligence that culminated in the shooting on November the 30th, 2021. Um, just off the top of my head, buying the gun, not locking the, not locking the firearm up, not taking him home when, when asked, uh, not asking him about the gun on November the 30th, not reacting in, in a variety of different ways when shown that, that math worksheet in November 30th. There wasn't one single act of gross negligence. It occurred over a continuum. We presented evidence in the Jennifer Crumbly case from March 2021 till December of 2021. In the James Crumbly case, again, March from 2021 to December of 2021. Over the period of those um, eight months, Judge, there were a number of acts for this court to rely upon. We do believe that OB-13 is appropriately scored upon. <coughs> Anything else from probation? Um, again, I'm, I, I have reviewed um, all of the PRVs and OBs and the case law in the statute, and I believe it's correctly scored. Your Honor, the next suggestion Mrs. Crumley has is to offense variable 19. This is a different type of argument than the prior argument, so I just want to let the court know. Um, this offense variable is to be scored when a defendant interferes with or attempts to interfere with the administration of justice. And the reason this was scored against Mrs. Crumley is because of the claim that she tried to run and tried to avoid arrest. On the night before charges were issued, I texted Miss McDonald directly, which I attached to my memo, and said, I, just, I, I, don't, it's, I, I know it's argument, Judge, but we've been over this before a number of times. And the court's, a, a charged felon doesn't get to text somebody. I to and the court is already taking that. So I ask you to I'm, I'm going to let her make her sure argument, but I, I, we've had this discussion before. Law enforcement does not have to ask for permission to arrest someone. If, if I have an outstanding warrant, one of these deputies could come up to this bench right now and cuff me. I understand that, but what the prosecution has done is put together a false narrative that's been repeated by the media over and over and over. And it's been repeated in court. Miss McDonald is the one who said they were in an industrial building. She's the one who used it, the word it abandoned. A, a, it was a warehouse, a non-retail place that was closed at night. It, right? it was not a warehouse. It was a building that had businesses in it. It was a non-retail building. 
No, there are there are retail businesses in there, and there are businesses in there that are not retail businesses. Either way, it was not an abandoned warehouse. Okay. Okay. And then the prosecution argued and put on the record. I guess it's hard for me to understand why it matters whether it was abandoned or not. Okay, because the narrative the media has played over and over and over repeats inaccurate information. I can't it, control the media, trust me. I, I understand. However, the prosecution also stated falsely and knowingly falsely, based on the fact they had a video when Mrs. Crumbly and Mr. Crumbly were found, the prosecution claimed they were crouched under a mattress, which is just not true. They were laying on a mattress, on a mattress. Right. At the time, though, they made it sound like they're crouching and hiding, and the media reported that over and over and over, and that has been a major problem throughout this case, and why I asked this court for a gag order. And we were thankful for the gag order. It did eliminate some more of the narrative coming out. But the prosecution very successfully painted this picture of people on the run. Meanwhile, Ms. Lehman and I can't do anything more to get our clients turned in. We are desperately calling the prosecutor's office, filing appearances with the court, making arrangements. Our clients are being threatened so badly, they are terrified to just go walk into a jail where everyone is looking for them in Michigan. We plan to be with them as their attorneys, and it's complete garbage that the prosecution has been able to carry this narrative out through trial. And that's why I did attach my text messages to Ms. McDonald letting her know. <coughs> All she had to do was say, I am charging. She did not let me know. She does not have to do that. It's a professional courtesy that most prosecutors do. It just is. <coughs> not in a case like this. I'm not Ms. Lehman. Because, well, there's different arguments for each defendant. That's correct, Your Honor. They are different arguments. Okay. So I just want to address this briefly, Judge. First of all, this court may recall the text messages that the court allowed to be admitted in the Jennifer Crumley case. At 11.16 p.m. That's correct, Judge. Text messages between Shannon Smith and the defendant. Mm -hmm. We're hiding out. We may have been found. And then the response was, oh, shit. Oh, I have done. That's not That's what it was. That evidence. came right. But that was not texted by Mrs. Crumley. Okay, well, she was already asleep. Okay, here, here's the problem with that. Because the, the evidence has shown um, that both of the set, defendant's sentencing memos address the arrest in Detroit. You've suggested on numerous occasions that the prosecutor was required to make arrangements with one, with one or more, both of the defendants to turn themselves in. I, I know that in circumstances where someone is charged with a retail fraud, something like that, you might get a common letter. They're not required to do it. Do we, do we all, all want things to happen the nice way? Sure. But it's, it's, it's not true. Law enforcement is not required to ask permission to arrest people. The fact of the matter is the charges were announced at noon. They knew about the charges. You knew about the charges, right? Not until after the press conference. At noon. And then we okay. were trying to it's make arrangements. Dime. It's my dime. Sorry. You, they do not have to make arrangements with you. I know that's the nice way. That's the safe way. The, sh the fugitive apprehension team was in contact with you. The defendants were aware and did not turn themselves in. They went to a non-retail establishment in Detroit and hunkered down. It's unclear to this court, to this day, whether they intended to flee the state. But the fact remains that they brought the cir circus to the city of Detroit. They did. There was al there's also been testimony by Mrs. Crumley and an allegation by Mr. Crumley in the sentencing memo that the defendants were not avoiding detection in that building. That allegation flies in the face of the testimony at each of the trials. We had testimony from Luke Kirkley. He testified that he made eye contact with Mr. Crumley in the parking lot. He went back into the building. We see that on the video uh, at the art studio building, industrial building, whatever you want to say, that the defendant, Mr. Crumley, followed Luke back into the building just after that. Luke immediately called 911 at 1043. I, I reviewed the all the testimony in this area. The Detroit police arrived 20 minutes after that 911 call. Their text from Mrs. Crumley's phone at 1116 p.m., despite the fact that she testified she took four Xanax, drank vodka, and was asleep by 11 p.m. That is simply not true. 
numerous agencies, including the Detroit Police Department, Border Patrol, SWAT, the Oakland County Sheriff's Department, and the Oakland County Fugitive Apprehension Team descended on this industrial building. The Detroit SWAT team entered the building at midnight and started breaking down doors with a steel ram. They started on the second and third floor. They obtained a key to the door where the defendants were on the first floor an hour and a half later. The suggestion that the defendants were asleep and did not hear this is, is highly improbable. Thank you, Judge. The only addition I have to that is the court referenced the testimony from, from the trial judge, and I appreciate that because Sar retired Sergeant Hendrick as well as Lieutenant Willis testified very clearly upon multiple questions. Is the sheriff's office function to, to trigger the fugitive apprehension team? Is a law enforcement function? It doesn't happen because of a, a request or demand by the prosecutor's office. It's wholly separate and distinct. That was clear in the testimony. I just want that to be part of the record. <coughs> Thank you, Judge. Um, did you want to make a different statement about that? I did, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. um, and it's because I, I don't believe that Mr. Crumbly was assessed 15 points for OB-19 for the same reason as Mrs. Crumbly was. Um, Mr. Crumbly was assessed 15 points um, for, it says in the guidelines, the offender used the force or the threat of force against another person or the property of another person to interfere with, attempt to interfere with, or that results in the interference with the administration of justice or the rendering of emergency services. Your Honor, it, I read that scoring to be scored because of the claims made by Ms. McDonald's office that Mr. Crumbly has made threats and threats of physical harm to Ms. McDonald um, over the phone yes. at the jail. Um, Your Honor, I'm disputing, and I have disputed, I did it during the trial when this was originally raised, and I've done it since then, that, that Mr. Crumbly has ever made a physical threat against Prosecutor McDonald. He has vented, he has been angry, he has been angry for the reasons that I've cited in my sentencing memorandum, but he has never threatened to physically harm Ms. McDonald. He has never said that if you continue with this prosecution, I'm going to hurt you. He has never said, if you don't stop this right now, I'm coming after you. Instead, as I indicated in my sentencing memorandum, the statements made by Mr. Crumbly, although there has been some language that may not be very respectful, that may be angry out of frustration for being incarcerated and on lockdown for 23 hours a day for the last two and a half years for something that Mr. Crumley and I maintain that he did not do illegally or wrong. But he, he vented his frustrations, Your Honor, and he never threatened harm. He never said if Ms. McDonald continues that he's going to do something or Mr. Keith or Mr. Williams or anyone else at the prosecutor's office or law enforcement. So he scored 15 points presumably based on these claims of threatened physical harm against Ms. McDonald, which we dispute ever happened. Um, Mr. Crumbly and I maintained that OB-19 should be scored at zero. Um, again, we also dispute that he was ever fleeing, so even if the prosecution wanted to change their theory to the flight, we would dispute that he was even fleeing, although I understand what the court just indicated and what Mr. Keyes has indicated previously. So for the purposes of scoring, OB-19 should be scored at zero. There have been no threats of physical harm. There have been no interference with the administration of justice. Um, there, there is a, a thumb drive of the threats. We could play them, or Mr. Keast could read them into the record. I don't know to what extent the prosecution would like to address. I, I do. I, I hope not to, Judge, but I do need a response in here. I'm, I'm not going to read all of them. They're on page four of our sentencing memorandum. And, I, and we did attach them as the court indicated. So I know the court has listened. Mm -hmm. OB-19 should be scored at 50 points if the offender used force or the threat of force against a person to interfere with or attempt to interfere with the in administration of justice. I don't know any other purpose for what James Crumbly did other than to interfere with the administration of justice. He knew specifically that his jail calls were recorded. He knew, or at least he believed, that the elected official, Ms. McDonald, was listening to him because he sent a message specific to her. He did it not just in an abstract sense, Judge. He did it while she was actively prosecuting the case. I have had a number of instances where defendants threatened witnesses. Rarely do we see a defendant threatening the prosecutor, let alone a member of a trial team, let alone the elected official. There will be retribution. She's going to be fucking sucking on a fucking hot rock down at hell soon. I'm on a fucking ramp. I'm on. I'm fucking on a rampage, Karen. Yes, Karen McDonald. Your ass is going down, and you better be fucking scared. I didn't want to read that, Judge. That was just a few weeks before the trial. 
I don't know any other definition what that could be other than a specific threat made to a member of the trial team. We ask that this defendant be treated no differently than any other defendant who would make a similar statement to any prosecutor or defense attorney or judge in this building. OB-19 is certainly <coughs> scored at 15 points. Um, I believe that it's correctly scored with regard to Mrs. Crumley and Mr. Crumley based um, on their avoidance avoiding uh, law enforcement while at the art studio, industrial building, whatever you want to call it, um, on that evening uh, for a long period of time. Um, but in the alternative, um, there, there's alternative theories uh, for scoring OB-19 as reg uh, with regard to Mr. Crumley. I, you know, regardless of his ability to make good on those threats because of his incarceration, I still uh, do believe that those uh, were, were threats against the prosecutor. Thank you, Judge. Your Honor, Mrs. Crumbly has no further <coughs> objections to the scoring <coughs> at this time. Mr. Crumbly has no additional objections to the scoring, Your Honor. Right. Um, I have a number of written um, statements that were provided by various individuals. I'm, I'm going to read the names of the people. Um, could you tell me the pronunciation of Madison Baldwin's mother's name, Nicole Boussoleil? Yes. Boussoleil. Um, um, and the mother of Hannah, Ms. Ms. St. Juliana. Is it I? I. St. Juliana, Kristen Baldwin, Baldwin, Raina St. Juliana, Steve St. Juliana, Jess Fabe, Molly Bernal, Daniel Kozak, Andrew Muska, Marla Lay, Olivia Up Upham, Renee Upham, Megan Gregory, Patricia Cunningham, Linda Russo. Those are individuals uh, who provided written statements, and I have copies of those. Um, I wasn't sure who had what statements, so they were scanned by my office and sent to everyone yesterday. Um, I know that there are a number of individuals who want to um, address the court. I guess I should ask if at any time anybody feels like they need a break, they should tell me. All right. All right. So um, you do not. You have not objected. Correct. Yes. All right. Do you want to do that at this time? Could we take a break now? So yeah. Do you before the impact statement? Yeah, do you need a break? Oh, um, I guess I would ask, you've had time to review the written statements, correct? Your Honor, we did get them late last night. I'm going to read over them during this brief break again. I have read over them once, but I'm going to read again just to ensure that there are no objections. Yeah, I didn't, I, I didn't have reason to believe that you didn't have copies of them, but um, they weren't necessarily funneled to the probation department. Some of them were sent directly to us. We've, I've gotten letters from people from across the country that were very interesting, so. Your Honor, um, may, I, may I say one thing uh, regarding the victim impact statements? Um, the, the victims are not in the courtroom required to provide their their oral statement to us before they deliver it. Correct. And some chose to do that. Correct. Some chose not to. Based on our prior experience with the shooter sentencing, sometimes they chose to submit it, and it was different when they delivered it. So I just want to make it clear that um, we, we, under the Crime Victim Rights Act, nor do I think it's appropriate to have any um, control or edit or, or of what they're going to say because it's, it's their impact statement. So. Uh, yeah, I understand. And I, d I ha have gotten some written statements from individuals who I believe intend to make an oral statement as well. So, yeah, that, that's, that's up to the individual. All right? Your Honor, with respect to the statements, initially um, the defense for Mrs. Crumley was concerned about the number of statements we believe that the court can sort through what to take into consideration for this sentencing and plus the court has lots of experience doing so and so we do if at some point there was an objection in terms of discussion uh -huh. we, we don't have an objection at this time yeah I, you know what I, you, you guys were on this email yesterday that uh, discussed all of the individuals who, were, who would be giving oral statements correct sir. 
Yes. And um, I know we all want that. I, I think we've all discovered a little glitch in the Crime Victims Rights Act that um, it's not specifically clear um, who's considered a victim of the Crime Victims Rights Act. There's some um, difference of opinion, maybe, but I'm, I'm again relying on Albers that discusses OB3 and uh, gives a broad definition of, of who a victim is. In any event, I am inclined to hear oral statements from all the individuals that were listed in the email that um, went to all of you last night. All right? We have no, I have no objection to the individuals on that list, Your Honor. All right. Yeah, same here. <laughs> and I, I certainly would appreciate you making any objections to their statements um, um, at the end of, of their statement. All right? Your Honor, I, I don't know if we need to approach on that because there was some discussion by email about the objections. Okay. Well, um, or maybe we can handle it during the break, Judge. All right. When you say making an objection, while the, the individual, I, I'm going to insist that everyone keep their um, statements directed at sentencing for sure. Okay. Your Honor, I don't anticipate, and I don't, and I don't believe Ms. Smith would anticipate making objections to a victim impact statement. Okay. Um, obviously, things could have, Your Honor. Excuse me. Um, and obviously, we have duties to our clients as well. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't be doing it in a disrespectful way to anyone, Your Honor. But um, we would just ask. Again, you've already reminded the court. I'm certain that the prosecutor's office has reminded anyone making a statement what the guidelines are in relation to those statements. So I don't anticipate having to make an objection, Your Honor. But um, obviously, if if one arises, an objection would have to be made. Judge. All right, all right. Uh, do your clients need to go downstairs? Yes. Yes, yes. Your Honor. Just, just two things briefly. Um, there are no guidelines in the victim impact statement. It's, it's, how the victim's impact, it's, it's personal and unique. Just, sure. I, you know, obviously, the court knows that. I just wanted to, to make sure we were clear on that. But and, we have to be directed at something. Yeah. And, and one um, housekeeping matter, we just need to, to add in, we can stipulate, with the defense, the defense will stipulate, we add in the additional victim impact statements received last night, as well as James Kremlin's GED verification, um, just for the, the PSI. Well, I didn't ask you if we had any additions to the PSI. That's all. Today. I'm sorry. Okay. His, his GED and what else did you say? His GED verification and the additional victim impact statements that weren't received by the department. Yeah, I think we got some at about 6 o'clock last night, right? Right. So, yeah. If, if you're not in receipt of something, you should let me know. It, it, it was hard to determine at what at one time who was receiving what. So if Maybe we can discuss with the prosecution who we should have impact statements from and determine whether or not we are missing any impact statements, the written impact statements. Because we did receive some later last night. I don't know. If yeah, we sent those last night. I received what the court sent and mm -hmm. what's in the PSIR. Correct. That's what I received. I don't think there's anything else. We received one this morning. Oh, Mr. Schilling. Yes, sir. But I believe Mr. Schilling is going to make an oral statement. Correct. Is that correct? Yes, so sir. I wasn't concerned about that. Thank you. I was, I was referring to the written letters received by the court. Okay. Which, those are, that's what we got last that's night. Right. 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 Everything right. in my possession was sent. Thank you very much for clarifying, Judge. All right. All right. So um, um, both of the defendants are going to go downstairs. So I want everyone to remain seated during that. All right. Thank you.
Recording in progress. Your Honor, calling people versus James Crumbly, case number 22279-989-FH. Calling people versus Jennifer Crumbly, case number 22279-990-FH. Thank you. Good morning, Mark. Case number the people. Chair McDonald, on behalf of the people. Good morning, Your Honor. Mario Lehman on behalf of James Crumbly, who is seated to my right. And I'm Shannon Smith on behalf of Jennifer Crumbly, who is seated to my right. Good morning. Um, I, now we're going to conduct the uh, oral victim impact statements, correct? Your Honor, if I could have just a couple of very brief moments. I neglected to make an argument on OB9 earlier. If the court could just allow me to make a very brief record, I would appreciate it. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, very briefly, People v. McGraw 484 MISH 120 is a 2009 case which indicates that the, the sentencing guidelines and scoring of those guidelines are limited to the sentencing offense. Obviously, we have four separate counts. Um, in the information in this case. Mm -hmm. People versus Vanilla Machado, that's a hyphenated name, 489 MISH 412, is a 2011 case which states that you cannot aggregate offenses for the purposes of scoring. So where they're separate in that case, it was assaults. They couldn't aggregate the assaults for the purposes of scoring, that each assault had to be scored separately. In this case, the score for offense variable nine is 100 for the multiple deaths that occurred for the deaths of the four students. Mm -hmm. I'm objecting to the scoring of 100 under Bonilla Machado um, because each death is supposed to be counted separately and individually and not aggregated for multiple deaths. And that, that was the only objection I wanted to make. Um, Mr. Keese, I'm going to allow you to address that. I, th I think you already did. But... I did, Judge. Yes. Okay. The, the probation is in the air, too. I have to defer Ms. Wheeler, but right. we've already made this argument. Ms. Wheeler? Anything else? Um, Judge, only the, the sentencing guideline manual states that you cannot aggregate victims of separate crimes. But I, I think the defense argued earlier that this wasn't a separate crime. Um, and the shooting occurred in a span of eight minutes. Uh, it, it was not one shooting and then a half hour later. Uh, it was a very quick procession. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, all right, again, I believe it's correctly scored, but. Thank you for allowing me to make the record. Sure, no problem. No problem. Um, all right, and then with regard um, to victim impact statements. Yes, Judge. Yeah. Sure. Good morning. Good morning. I wasn't doing his right job at the French pronunciation of your name, Nicole Beausoleil, correct? Correct. Was that right? Yes. All right. Um, what do you have to say? Um, All right. Um, what do you have to say? Um, I, would, I would like to start with the person that matters the most. Madison, she was a kind soul. She always had a smile on her face. She lit up the room when she walked in. Her laugh I could listen to all day. It was infectious. Her big sister skills were undeniable and she took that role very seriously. Madison was smart, funny, loving, passionate, determined, and genuine. Her expectations were high and at times we needed to let her fall. She needed to be reminded that not everything is perfect, even if she wanted it to be. Madison had an influence that most never achieved. Sometimes I would listen to a poem she wrote or watched her create art with no tracing, just pure talent. 
she would talk about college and what majors she would like to do and what would be most helpful to society. The passion that she had for everything and everyone was remarkable. I would catch myself watching her and thinking to myself, how lucky am I? I'm the one that gets to be her mom. What did I do to deserve a perfect person? She will be the best thing to ever happen to me at such a young age myself. I grew up because of her. We grew together. I learned from her. I mattered because of her. From the moment she was born, I promised myself that I would be there no matter what. Through the falls, heartbreak, letdowns, and struggles, I would be there. I would listen, listen, learn, and love every moment. I wouldn't miss a thing. I would always protect her. On November 30th, 2021, exactly 17 years, six months, and 13 days made me break my first promise, and it will hurt for eternity. As her mom, I didn't protect her. First, I'd like to say thank you to the prosecution team. I say thank you to you all. Saying thank you really doesn't seem enough anymore. The countless hours you've worked, the time away from your family, and always taking our feelings into consideration. Karen and Mark, the work you've put into getting all the facts, speaking to us, speaking to us like we matter, and never wavering from your goal. It speaks volumes of the people you are, and I'm proud to call you a part of Madison's voice. Advocates and Jen, I'm not sure where to start. You've all seen me hit points in this tragedy that some days I wasn't sure who I was. One minute I'm laughing, next I'm crying, and sometimes I'm just silent. Either way, one thing stayed consistent. You always listened. Jen, you're not just a friend, you are family. My mind keeps going back to something during the trials. Something that is almost on repeat like a broken record. It's something as a mother I can't understand. And honestly, I don't think any mother, mother would understand. It was when Jennifer said, it wouldn't do anything different. I'm putting a little emphasis on different as I know life throws us things that are out of, out of our control. But life takes turns and eventually puts them back in our control. Like giving you a hint when something needs to change. I want to compare a few things to see through my perspective. As I know things are different about the events and how we see them from the events on November 30th. While your son was hearing voices and asking for help, I was helping Madison pick out her senior classes. While you were perching, seeing a gun for your son and leaving it unlocked, I was helping her finish her college essays. While you dropped him off at school, upset that he was failing class, I texted Madison, drive safe, it's slick outside, have a good day. When you got a call to me at the school about your son and how it interfered with your day, I was rearranging my schedule so I could take Madison to get her oil changed for the first time. When you left without hesitation and not taking him home, I was worried if she'd be okay driving in the first snowfall of the season and if she brought a coat. When you walked out of the office with a steady pace after hearing an active shooter, I ran from my home and started driving trying not to break the law. When you were on the phone for 10 minutes with each other trying to figure out where the gun was, I was on the phone with her father and family trying to figure out where she was. When you left the Myers without knowing where your son was, I was desperately trying to get there as soon as possible. When you knew the gun was missing, you called the police, knowing it was your son who took it. I was having family call every hospital describing what she looked like. When you texted, Ethan, don't do it. I was texting Madison, I love you, please call mom. When you 
found out about the lives your son took that day. I was still waiting for my daughter in a parking lot. When you questioned the reasoning on why you would do this, I was questioning if I would, was doing enough to find her. When you got a chance to speak with your son, seeing him alive and showing no support, I was watching families reunite with their children, waiting for my moment. When you asked him why, I was waiting for the answer on to why the last bus never came. When you, when the police showed up at your house, you didn't understand why they were there. And I was asking police if they checked every possible location and if I could go search too. When you texted about not losing your job and you needed a lawyer, I was still calling my daughter because she came first in all parts of my life. When you could leave your house, I was still a prisoner in Myers. When you worried about what people thought of you and feeling threatened, I was learning your son threatened my daughter and fatally shot her in the head. When you drove to get your burner phones for communication, I was laying on the floor in Myers for hours crying because I forgot how to speak. When you checked into your first hotel, I was telling Madison's 11-year-old sister she was gone. When you cared more about yourself and getting alcohol and supplies, I was identifying my daughter in a medical office wishing I could take her place. While you were hiding, I was planning her funeral. And while you were running away from your son and your responsibilities, I was forced to do the worst possible thing a parent could do. I was forced to say goodbye to my Madison. We all see things different. Some prioritize and some don't. Accountability can only be given if you actually try it in the first place. As a parent, we all make mistakes. This is a normal way of life. Usually when mistakes happen, we learn from them. We try to fix it or talk it over. But continuing to make the same mistake over and over again is no longer a mistake, it's a choice. That becomes a decision. Those decisions that you made ultimately took my, life, my daughter's life. Because you decided that you didn't want to parent and listen to your son, you took the right away for me to be a mother. You do not get to decide that. You do not get those privileges. You are not above anyone. I love being a mom. It's the one thing that I'm truly great at. You cared more about your well-being than the one life that you should put above anyone, your child. And because of that, you took, that you both took four beautiful children away from this world. Being a parent is the best, is the part of life that you should hold to the highest level. It's an honor to be a mother or a father. Even when you think you have done your best, you continue to do more. Unfortunately, you, you never made it to level one. You say you wouldn't do anything different. Well, that really says on what type of parents you are, because there's a lot of things I would do different. But the one thing would, I would have wanted to be different was to take that bullet that day so she could continue to live the life she deserved. You show no remorse, no respect or compassion for our family. The same traits that you bestowed upon your son. The traits that you have torn my family into pieces. The lack of compassion that you have shown is outright disgusting. Not only did your son kill my daughter, but you both did as well. The words involuntary should not be a part of your offense. Everything you did that day, months prior and days after were voluntary acts of your son to commit a murder. Not just one, but multiple. Shaking your head during a verdict is the utmost disrespectful thing I have ever witnessed. At that moment, you felt your life is more valuable than my daughter's. I will say that will never be true. 
you created a life that you took for granted. You decided that parenting wasn't a priority. Putting your child first should be the only priority. You didn't, and because of that, I've lost my daughter. I had to get answers after her death. Watching the video, hearing testimony on how your son executed my daughter, watching him put the gun to her head as she covered her head and pulled the trigger, seeing pictures of her laying in her own pool of blood, knowing her body sat there for hours, that rigor mortis had already started to set in, so that when I identified her, her body was in a state I couldn't imagine. Hearing her sister scream over and over again, night after night, watching your family and her friends fall apart. You created all of this. You created your son's life, which then allowed this to be his path, which should be yours as well. You don't get to look away. You don't get to cry. I didn't get that choice. You failed as parents. The punish punishment that you face will never be enough. It will never bring her back. It will never be a loss that you have suffered and it will never heal the pain. Because one day you're gonna be able to see your son, visit, hear his voice, possibly laugh, maybe see him grow. I will never see that again. The, the so-called loss that you say you have suffered doesn't even compare to the loss of a child. Your Honor, I request that the maximum sentence be enforced as it will never come close to the life sentence I was given. A life sentence that I didn't ask for, but a choice that was made for me. A life that I will suffer because of their negligence. negligence. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Jill Swatley. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Honorable Judge Cheryl Matthews, for your time on this case. I know it hasn't been easy on both. Thank you also to Karen McDonald and the entire prosecution team. We appreciate your efforts. Your Honor, my trauma and devastation is hard to put to words but I have done so in my letter to you. I would also like to mention Justin's brothers, Nathan and Clay. They are now forced to live a life without their beloved middle brother, Justin. My son, Justin, was the least deserving of his fate. He was the best son that any mother could pray for. Justin was brave, spending his final moments protecting a fellow student. He was hardworking, a lettered athlete, a top honor student. He was kind and inclusive to all. He was full of love and joy. His future was so very bright and full of possibilities. His passing has touched so many family members, friends, students, and the community in general. The ripple effects of both James and Jennifer's failures to act have devastated us all. This tragedy was completely preventable. If only they had done something, Your Honor, anything, to shift the course of events on November 30th, then our four angels would be here today and Justin would be getting ready to celebrate, celebrate his 20th birthday on the 18th of this month. If only, Your Honor, they had taken their son to get counseling instead of buying him a gun. If only they had secured that gun. <coughs> if only they had spoken up that day in the counseling office. If only they had checked his backpack. If only they had taken him home or taking him to counseling instead of abandoning him at that school. I wouldn't be standing here today.
Your Honor. I don't know what's in their hearts. I'm not a mind reader. But I only know the facts of this case. And the facts of this case, both cases, have been deeply disturbing. What I would like to share with the shooter's parents is an example of what love looks like between a mother and her son. This is what Justin wrote to me on one of the last birthdays that we celebrated together. Dear Mom, words cannot describe how thankful I am for you. You have been nothing but an amazing mother for as long as I can remember. Thank you for being a role model. Thank you for showing me what it's like to never give up. You inspire me to do better each and every day. I love you so much. Love, Justin. It is devastating and heartbreaking that it doesn't appear that either of you cherished or even wanted your son. But I wholeheartedly wanted and cherished mine. You have failed your son and you have failed us all. This failure had deadly consequences that can never be undone, that can never be made right. I am asking your honor for the maximum sentence allowed. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Craig Schilling, Dustin's dad. Um, so, Honorable Judge Matthews, for the second time in six months, I find myself standing in front of a packed courtroom, a victim. This time, I'm here to address a different judge and the parents of the deeply disturbed teenager that murdered my son. This is my opportunity to try to describe just how much the horrific event that took place back on November 30th, 2021 has impacted my life. It's my belief that an impact statement should not just describe how this particular event impacted me. I feel that it should also be impactful towards all who hear it. And in your case, Judge, I hope these words impact you in a way that influence your decisions here today. As I look around at all the lawyers police officers, media folks, and other victims, I can't help but ask myself, what could I possibly say that this whole scenario doesn't already say? This is messed up. Most people will never have to make a victim impact statement to the course of their lives. And the fact that the victims speaking here today are doing so for the second time in six months should speak volumes in and of itself. This is not normal. Living a life like this is not normal. So how does it affect a normal guy? To be completely honest with you, it remains a rather difficult and uncomfortable question to answer. In my previous impact statement, I've expressed many of my day-to-day -day struggles from uncontrolled emotional outbreaks to sleepless nights to not being able to focus on the normal daily tasks. Yeah, it's fair to say that I live every day with pain, anger, heartache, regret, anxiety, stress, you name it. They are all there wreaking havoc in my once normal life. They say that time heals all wounds. Well, we're, we're coming up on two and a half years now and I can assure you that the wounds are still as fresh as they were on that tragic day. And with this hole that has been left in my life, still glaringly obvious, I fight every day to not lose more of myself within that very hole. I have spent the last 30 years of my life busting my butt to support a family, raise children, and try to set myself up for some peace and quiet in the golden years of life. But the unthinkable has happened. And that peace and quiet I've worked so hard for may never come to be. At least not to the degree that I've always imagined it. Literally every single aspect of my life has been affected by this tragedy. And I could spend a long time describing in detail just how it has impacted me, but it seems like it would be way easier for me to just tell you how this tragedy hasn't impacted me. 
because there's simply nothing on that list. Now that the verdict is out on this monumental case, I feel strongly that it has caught the attention of most parents across the country. The overwhelming facts in this case were all that was necessary to prove that James and Jennifer Crumley not only neglected their son by failing to get the necessary mental care that was clearly needed, <coughs> providing them the very tools necessary to carry out those heinous acts of violence. It was these very facts that allowed not just one, but two full juries to find both of them guilty of involuntary manslaughter. I will always maintain the opinion that the facts that were presented in these cases were strong enough to convince any jury of their guilt, and that the verdict would have been the same regardless of where the trial was held. As I have maintained throughout the course of the past couple of years, being the parent of a murdered child tends to cause you to seek out the maximum penalties allowed for each guilty verdict derived from any of the criminal charges. I think this stance is completely justified and would be so for any parent in, this position, in the same position as mine. However, this is a court of law where a person is innocent until proven guilty and the defendant has the right to dispute the facts of, of the charges against them. That being said, during the course of both of these trials, I did my best to capture every word and process all the facts. This is important because there is value in these facts, not just in the thousands and thousands of man hours invested in gathering, processing, and organizing the evidence, but also for being able to use that evidence to establish the cold, hard truth of this tragic situation, that James and Jennifer Crumley failed in their parental responsibilities as they pertain to the shooter who was their son. The cold truth that shows that they did nothing to address the obvious signs of the deteriorating mental state of mind clearly present within their son. And of course, the very hard truth that shows that they provided their son with exactly what he wanted to use to do what he did and failed miserably to secure his foot. One would probably think that in order for something like this, or something of this magnitude to even happen at all, there would have to be a ton of things that went wrong. Although there were some things that definitely went wrong that day, or several of those things, I believe that if they had been handled correctly, we wouldn't be here right now. And James and Jennifer Crumley carry the bulk of the responsibility needed to handle those things. During their trials, the overall similarities between the two were evident, and I believe this is why they were both convicted. Numerous facts that were the same for both trials show clearly that the parents failed their son, and ultimately the entire community. With Jennifer, the thing that resonates most is that she stated that even knowing what she knew now, she still wouldn't have changed a thing. I almost died when she said that. Four precious lives were lost at the hands of her son by the means, by means that she helped provide. She saw the drawing of the murder drawn with the hands of her son. She sat and heard the request of the counselor and did nothing. And she still says, or says that she wouldn't have changed a thing. I just don't understand how someone can be that heartless to make a statement like that. The blood of our children is on your hands, too. This is but one reason why I feel that Jennifer should receive a maximum amount of hurt for her sentence. The facts presented should be all the others that you should need. With her distinct lack of remorse and overall unethical understanding of the tragedy, I feel that the maximum amount of time available is needed for her to be able to fully comprehend the gravity of her actions and the lack thereof. With James, there were a couple of things that jumped out at me in particular, but one thing that is the toughest to digest is the fact that when the verdict was being read, he sat there and shook his head in total disagreement, as if to suggest that the jury was wrong and that there were no grounds for a guilty verdict. I was dumbfounded to see him shake his head with such disbelief an action that only suggests that he truly believes he did nothing wrong. How could you possibly think that? 
Four precious lives were lost at the hands of your son by means that he helped, but by means that he helped provide. He saw the drawing of the murder, drawn with the hands of the son. He sat and heard the request of the counselor and did nothing. I just don't understand how someone can so arrogantly dawdle in a pool of self-pity without being able to say one thing to justify themselves. The blood of our children is on your hands too. This is but one reason why I feel James should receive the maximum amount of for his sentence. The facts presented should be all the others that you need. With this distinct lack of remorse and overall unethical understanding of the tragedy, I feel that the maximum amount of time available is needed for him to be able to fully comprehend the gravity of his actions and the lack thereof. Throughout the course of all of this, and I'm talking from way back in the beginning, I just can't get over the fact that this tragedy was completely avoidable. There were some pretty obvious signs that were completely overlooked, and the bulk of, of the responsibilities to address those signs lied on the parents, and they failed, across the board failed. They willfully ignored the cries of their child and selfishly put themselves before helping him. This type of blatant disregard is undeniably unacceptable. It is a large reason why the events, of that, the events of that day were able or were allowed to happen, and another reason why I feel they both need the maximum amount of time available to be able to fully comprehend the gravity of their actions and the lack thereof. We all know that having children is a big responsibility. Although extremely rewarding, it starts out pretty scary. I mean, let's face it, they don't exactly come with instructions. There's no meet button, and unfortunately, no pause or rewind buttons either. Oh yeah, and there are times in the beginning that they really smell. Yet we still have them. We still want that responsibility, even though it's not very clear what it all entails. But how can we accept that responsibility and not act responsibly towards that child? It doesn't add up. A child, even if she is an oopsie child, deserves the same amount of love, compassion, and compare that every other child gets. A child deserves someone who is confident enough to lead by example. Because let's face it, it wasn't that child's choice to come into this world. You made them. And it's your responsibility to teach them how to live. It's your responsibility to, get a, to set a good example. It's plain and simple, just like that, ladies and gentlemen. And the sooner we can figure it out, figure that out, the better we all will be. Being a parent is hard work, but if it's done correctly, it can be the most rewarding work you ever do. There is no one that can tell you how to do it, because each child is so precious and unique. I mean, there's no other one like them in the entire world, and that says a lot. So cherish your one and only's, and never give them up. Never give up on them, excuse me. The results of doing so can be catastrophic and can affect the lives of so many other people. Well, I ask for you all to go home today and hug your kids and make sure they know you are there for them and make sure that they are all right. It's so crucial for the whole of our society. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shelley. <clears throat> Our 10-year-old little brother had to learn how to write a eulogy for his sister before he even learned how to write essays. November 30th, 2021, all our parents did was send us off to school. Yet the next time they see Hannah is to recognize her lifeless body in a medical examiner's office. I met up with Hannah and a friend during school that day. When we split ways to go back to class, I just looked back and smiled. I didn't say goodbye. I never got to say goodbye. I never got to remind her that I love her, that she's my everything, the person I want to walk through life with side by side. <coughs> I thought her future was a given. Of course she'd play her first high school basketball game that night, get ready for all the other school dances, 
have her JV and varsity season for all the sports she played, get her driver's license, play her lacrosse season, have her first date, prom, graduation. She never got a chance for any of that. She didn't even get her 15th, 16th, 17th, or 18th birthday. These are only some of the high school experiences she never got to have, but it is absolutely nothing compared to the rest of everything she had going for her future. That list is eternal. Hannah's life had only started to begin. 12.51 p.m., November 30th, 2021, that was the moment I became aware of the fragility of our mortality. Hannah, who was healthy, Hannah, who was only 14, shot four times. 12.5% of the bullets shot that day were at her. She took her last breath in her own pool of blood in a school she hadn't even been in for three months. Alone for seven, seven minutes while police passed by her, bleeding out as a security guard failed to put a tourniquet on her, dying as EMS took more than 10 minutes after the shooter had been detained to even give aid to her. Our Japanese grandma would often worry about anything bad happening to us because she knew how dangerous it is here compared to Japan. She told me on FaceTime that Hana would respond with a laugh, saying, don't worry, I'm a fast runner, I'll outrun them. It wasn't possible for Hana to outrun the bullets bought by you, Jennifer Crumley, which were fired by the 9mm Sig Sauer that you, James, gifted to your son. Both used to murder Hana, Justin, Tate, and Madison. The fact is, no matter what you try to make yourself believe, Jennifer, you did fail as a parent, both of you. To love and to be loved, that is the human experience. It was up to you guys to show your son that. Instead of giving quality time and compassion, you gift your son a gun, a gun you knew caused extraordinary damage. There's a reason your kid didn't use the other two firearms or the .22 ammunition you own. I believe your actions cannot even be confined into the word failure. Your mistakes created our everlasting nightmare. So yes, you are still a danger to society because even after serving two years, you have yet to admit to your wrongdoings. And we know that when we do not learn from our mistakes, we repeat history. You call yourself a victim. The difference between you and Hannah, Justin Tate, and Madison, you and my family, you and all the students there that day, is that we didn't have a hand in causing this. You caused the most cruel thing I could ever imagine. You guys made loving Hana so painful. That is not a narrative, that is reality. For that, unless you have a time machine or the ability to stop time, there is no existing punishment or rehabilitation that will ever be enough. Because there is no way that the one life I have, I now have to live without Hana, my little sister, my best friend, my other half. To me, that makes the maximum sentence being 15 years too short. Hannah didn't even have 15 years to live. Jennifer, you stated that even after knowing everything you know now, you wouldn't do anything different. I cannot fathom that. I would do anything to hear her footsteps coming up the stairs. You don't have to roll your eyes, it's on video that she said that. To not have an empty seat at the dining table, to have her come into my room and ask which clothes to order, to see her napping on the couch, to laugh and share a look when we accidentally say the same thing at the same time. There's not a day that goes by that I wish I hadn't run out of that building. If I knew what I know now, I would do everything differently in a heartbeat. I hope time makes you think differently. One day, I hope you would have chosen to care for your son, teach him how to love and to be loved, that you would not choose to buy the bullets that enter children's bodies, that you would not choose to omit relevant important information to the counselor Sean Hopkins and Dean of Students Nicholas Ejak that could help their incompetent brains and one shared brain cell to decide to act and search the backpack. That you wouldn't still choose to hide from accountability when you're the reason we had to hide for our lives. That you would choose to save Hannah, Justin, Tate, and Madison. Like my mother said, both of you should implore that even on your worst days, it's the tomorrow Hannah doesn't get. The tomorrow she wanted to live so badly, the tomorrow that she should have. I can never do Hana justice when talking about her. She's all I want to talk about, and yet I would need a lifetime and still wouldn't have the right words to capture incandescence, humor, thoughtfulness, kindness, or loyalty. She's always there for you, helping without a second thought. She's always sharing, whether it's her smile, her food, her clothes, her crafts, her joy. She's funny. <laughs> It's a given, she brings people together. 
Whether it's her contagious laughter or sarcastic wit, you will be laughing right along with her. She's noticing the small things, new shoes, new haircut, cute jewelry, but even more importantly, she makes you feel seen. She's extremely spirited. Her energy is unmatched on or off the court. She dresses up every holiday, every spirit day, the first one to put up Christmas lights, or any lights for that matter, not even realizing she was a light for so many others. She's the one who would not only playfully roll her eyes and smile when I would say I'm taller than her as I look up to her. Not only did I look up to her physically because yes, she was taller, but as a whole, as a human being. She isn't perfect, but she's Hana, and to me that's as close as you can get. I can't convey what losing Hana has done to me. I miss her with every breath I take. I think going forward without her is something I'll never be able to fully navigate. I believe the word sad is inappropriate to use because it does nothing to capture the hurt or the way my soul shattered. I didn't know. I've never felt every atom of my body igniting from anger until Hana was murdered. I didn't know what it was like to want to stop waking up in the morning until she wasn't here. I have never known pain that is forever until seeing Hana in a casket. I didn't know it was possible to feel so isolated even when you're surrounded by people. I didn't know how it feels to not know yourself at all. I have no idea who I am without Hana. She's my happy. She's my home. I look for Hana in everyone I meet, every place I go, and it's exhausting when I'm met with disappointment every time. But it's the world. It's all the people she would have met. I grieve for them too. To have that chance of Hana being in your life taken away from you is a tragedy in and of itself. She's more, she's more of a person than you two combined times a trillion could ever even hope to be. But when the day comes that you re-enter society in 13 years, I hope you live more like Hana. I hope you live every moment to the fullest like Hana. I hope you laugh every day like Hana. And I hope you love unconditionally like Hana. That's it. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. I find myself in a rather odd state of mind today. Rather emotionally blank right now. Part of that is having to do this again. Part of that is I'm mostly a private person, and the idea of having to pour my heart out again is irritating. And I can't match the eloquent words that have come before me in the previous impact statements. So I'll limit my my words today. The defendants, through their choices, through their indifference and gross negligence, enabled the son, their son to murder my daughter, Hannah, and three other children. They chose to stay quiet. They chose to ignore the warning signs. And now, as we've heard through all of the objections, <coughs> They continue to choose to blame everyone but themselves. Every single ob objection, I think, that the council said this morning, put the blame somewhere else, their son, not them. I stood before the court several months ago and spoke about the impact that Han's murder had on myself and my family. Nothing has changed since then. It's impossible for me to truly convey the complete impact of my daughter's loss. Hannah's murder has destroyed a large portion of my very soul. I've said these words before. It's still the truth. I remain a shell of the person that I used to be. I think of her and miss her constantly. Every day is a battle to attempt to move forward, 
struggle to get out of bed, to go through the motions of everyday life. Simple everyday sights and actions bring pain, as I think what it should have been like with Hannah there with us. I think of all the good times that we've shared together as a family and mourn all of the memories that will never be. I will never think back fondly on her high school and college graduations. I will never walk her down the aisle as she begins the journey of starting her own family. I am forever denied the chance to hold her or her future children in my arms. A few words describing Hannah can in no way fully capture her truly beautiful, caring soul, or impart, impart her unlimited, unlimited potential. Hannah was absolutely beautiful and thoughtful person. She was always the first person to notice when someone had a problem and the first to go out of her way to offer help. She was incredibly curious and talented. She continually tried new things. She crafted homemade jewelry, tried cooking her own recipes, and played several sports. She was a record holder in track and a leader of her school volleyball and basketball teams. She also hoped to join her older sister on the lacrosse team in the spring. She had aspirations of her career dedicated to helping people. All of this is lost because of the defendant's actions and choices. My position regarding the defendant's sentencing and their future has evolved through their trials. At first, I was focused on the importance of getting a, ver a guilty verdict, to have the message conveyed to the public that this type of behavior and choices are not acceptable. I didn't have strong feelings about their sentencing. It was just something that would be determined by the system. My view, however, has changed as the defendant's level of defiance has grown. Instead of acknowledging any mistakes, they continue to show no remorse. They take no accountability. They and their lawyers continue to try to change the narrative and portray the defendants as victims of the prosecution team. They blame everyone but themselves and make threats of retribution. The facts have already been presented. The jury has found them guilty. Multiple juries have found them guilty. Hannah, Madison, Tate, and Justin are the ones who have lost everything, not the defendants. As such, I ask that this court to sentence the defendants to the maximum allowable penalty of 10 to 15 years in prison. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Mr. Mayor. Tate Mears' dad. Uh, first of all, um, Mark, Karen, the whole team. Strong work. Everybody said you couldn't do it, and you did it. For our family, it's not time to celebrate. This tragedy has taken hey, an incredible toll on our family. So our family's not going to give the Crumley family a second of our time up here. It's time to turn our focus now. This is the low-hanging fruit. Now it's time to turn our focus to Oxford schools who played a role in this tragedy. You know, I hear this, this morning when we're listening to all the objections and hear 
Sharon talking about protecting the criminals, civil rights, constitutional rights. Where's my rights being protected? I fight for everybody in this room. My rights aren't being protected. Criminals' rights are more important than our rights, my rights. We are ready for our government to perform an investigation on this tragedy. Many, many don't know that our government has not investigated this murder. A pre-shooting investigation, a day of the shooting investigation, and a deep dive investigation into the horrible response to this tragedy, the disrespect shown to us families, the simple things like trauma training for somebody like a Sheriff Bouchard who we got to talk to on the day that that we got to go identify Tate. And he referred to Tate as a girl because he was too busy that night working to cover up, cover it up, instead of learning what every, about every kid, Tate, Hannah, Justin, and Madison. It's time for the whole truth to come out. It's time to learn from this, from the purchase of the gun to the response. That's when real change happens, is when we can look at something and we can evaluate it, apply lessons learned. That's when real change happens. So how is St. Juliana's family ready for the truth? Justin Shelley's family ready to hear the truth? Nicole Baldwin's family ready to hear the truth? Tate Mears' family is ready to hear the truth. Quit denying us that. It's time to drive real change from this tragedy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That, that concludes the victim impact statement. There's no one else you're, you're not presenting anybody else. Correct. We've been watching victim impact statements in the sentencing hearing for the parents of a Michigan mass school shooter. Jennifer and James Crubley are the first parents ever convicted in a U.S. mass school shooting committed by their child. Now they've been hearing from family members of their son's victims describing the hurt and heartbreak they endured to this day. I want to bring in ABC News legal contributor Shauna Lloyd for more on this. Shauna, it's always heart-wrenching to hear these accounts, but at least some of these family members are not only talking about the in direct impact of the actions that the Crumbly son had on their lives, obviously killing their children, but also questioning their response to all of this. Absolutely. I mean, these victim impact statements have been very powerful. They've been very meaningful. <laughs> Madison, Justin, and to all those affected on November 30th, 2020. The gravity and weight this has taken on my heart and soul cannot be expressed into words. Just as I know there is nothing I can say that's going to ease the pain and suffering of the victims and their families. There's a quote I heard that rang true. Grief. For those of you who understand, no explanation is needed. And for those of us who do not, no description is possible. I've taken countless nights of lament over the anguish and shame I carry, knowing what my son did, the harm he caused innocent lives, the families, and to the entire Oxford community. I pray all the victims are the embodiment of God's mercy and peace and that he, he heals your broken spirits. When I was on the stand, 
I was asked if I would have done anything different. I was horrified to learn my answer I would not have was completely misunderstood. That answer is true because my, my son did seem so normal. I didn't have a reason to do anything different. This was not something I foresaw. That was the intention of my answer and how I interpreted the question. With the benefit of hindsight and the information I have now, my answer would be drastically different. If I even thought my son would be capable of crimes like these, things would have absolutely been different. Even worse, when I learned during the police investigation that he had been planning a school shooting before November 30th. He was not the son I woke up. So he was not the son I knew when I woke up on November 30th. The Ethan I knew was a good, quiet kid. He loved his pets, family vacations. My husband and I used to used to say we had the perfect kid. I truly believed that, and that's who I saw and thought I knew. As the details started emerging during discovery, I was horrified to learn concerning behaviors my son was reported doing at school. Refusing to take a makeup test, he told us he took. Sleeping in class, drawing pictures of guns on his assignments. Writing, quote, my family is a mistake. Watching a video in class of a mass shooting that fatal day along with internal communications that took place between his teachers and counselor, Mr. Hopkins. That he is, quote, on my radar, and quote, he seems to be having a rough time, was never disclosed to us, his parents. The school claimed this was not abnormal behavior because of the pandemic and Oxford being in a, quote, gun community. To say I was curious to learn this information is an understatement. This is not normal behavior to us and very different than what Ethan led us to believe was happening at school. Not only were you left in the dark about previous concerning behavior, but in the counselor's office that morning, none of those previous issues were brought to our attention. I can't stop thinking, had they been, the conversation that morning would have been much different. That we would have taken a deep dive into what's really been going on with my son. I wonder if Hopkins and Ejac have those same regrets too. Instead, we are led to believe, not only from Hopkins and Egypt, but from Ethan as well, that this was an isolated event. We felt confident in trusting the professional's advice to let him stay in school that day. Quote, he, did not, he does not pose a threat to himself or others. <coughs> it was suggested that him being around here would probably be good. We agreed. We were never asked to take him home that day. If that was discussed as the best course of action, we would have obliged. The prosecution keeps saying we didn't give them the big picture that morning at the counselor's office. But what they failed to acknowledge is the bigger picture the school did not give us. I'm not the same person I was prior to November 30th, 2021. This tragedy has changed who I am and has taught me some very valuable lessons. It's said in suffering, we gain wisdom. I've also gained God. In the quiet hours of myself, I prayed to him about the deep impact this tragedy has had on the families and the endless pain no one should ever have to feel. For it is God who holds a true understanding of our pain. I've also learned to depend on him for peace and strength. Alone, I'm not strong enough. I've learned that we cannot tell or predict what will happen to us in this life. One day you wake up and everything can change. We can, however, decide what happens in us, how we take it, what we do with it. And that's what really matters in the end. That's the test of living, is how we take the unimaginable, the tragedies, the raw hardships, and make them a thing of worth and beauty. I've also learned to think, to never think this could not happen to you, and stereotype that bad kids come from bad parents. The prosecution has tried to mold us into the type of parents society wants to believe are so horrible only a school or mass shooter could be bred from. This is a very <coughs> assumption to have. We were good parents. We were the average family. We weren't perfect, but we loved our son and each other tremendously. Everything we strive for was to make sure our son had the best life we could give him, to grow up with traditions and experiences we had, 
to be the best person he could be. I know we did our best. The love I have for our son, mixed with regret for not seeing what was ahead, weighs heavily on me. My point is, this could be any parent here in my, up here in my shoes. Ethan could be your child, could be your grandchild, your niece, your nephew, your brother, your sister. Your child can make a fatal decision, not just with the gun, but a knife, a vehicle, intentionally or unintentionally. If there's anything the general public can take away from this, is that this could happen to you too. The tragedy has taught me the true meaning of unconditional love as I watch my parents still love and care for me wholeheartedly, no matter what has happened. If there's nothing else I can do right in life, I do still love my son unconditionally, and perhaps that is my purpose. Your Honor, I don't envy the decision you have to make today. I understand this is a novel case, and punishment expectations are high, not just from the prosecution, but from all those affected as well. The heartbreaking journey these families have endured. Hang on, I have to back up. I missed, I missed the most important thing I need to ask. The most valuable piece of wisdom I gain is the power of forgiveness. To forgive the prosecution for the slander and hate against me and my husband. Ms. McDonald, Mr. Keith, I have hated you with deep anger, but hate is too heavy of the cross to carry. I need to be set free of that burden and recognize that you are people just like me, imperfect, but a child of God. I know he wants good things to happen to you, and in any conflict, whatever the circumstances, he is there loving both sides. To the victims and the families. I stand today not to ask for your forgiveness, as I know it may be beyond reach but to express my sincerest apologies for the pain that has been caused. Your Honor, I don't envy you in the decision you have to make today. I understand the punishment expectations are high from, from all sides. This heartbreaking journey the families have endured is more than anyone should have to bear and acknowledge in its full death. My time in confinement has been filled with deep remorse, regret, and grief over this tragedy. I have taken this one day at a time, trying to survive, navigate, and cope with the endless heartache, pain, and grief I feel for the families of Hannah, Justin, Madison, and Tate. I have also lost myself over my son's wrongdoing. I have been shredded by the public opinion, me, shamed as a horrible parent, pain to be a terrible person. But the worst hell I carry is my own self-judgment, remorse, and deep regret. I've been criticized, I don't show emotion, I'm unsympathetic, I don't cry enough, but alone I grieve. And if you were to look into me internally, you'd find I'd die on the inside. I will be in my own internal prison for the rest of my life. Your Honor, I ask you to take consideration that I have been locked in a cell 23 hours a day, essentially in solitary confinement, for over 28 months, and that the court finds a fair and just sentence for me. Thank you. Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Um, Your Honor, as I pointed out in my sentencing memo, this was a no-win case. Walking, when we walked in the door, there's, there are we have just heard from Jennifer Crumbly in the sentence hearing for her sentencing hearing for herself and her husband. Jennifer and James Crumbly are the first parents to ever be convicted in a U.S. mass school shooting committed by their child. We've been hearing uh, from victims talking about the impact that this shooting had on them and their families, and now hearing from Jennifer Crumbly herself. Uh, asking for leniency, asking the judge to recognize that she would do things differently now if she could, a little bit different from what she had testified during her trial, but also trying to tell the judge that this could be anyone, that what happened to her, that her family was a normal family, that they loved their son immensely, and that what happened to her and her husband could could happen to any parents. I want to bring in ABC News legal contributor Shauna Lloyd for more on this. Shauna, what stood out to you Let's start with the impact statements first from the victims here. We heard family after family get up and talk about the loss of their loved ones, but toward the end, the last two families didn't just talk about that and the impact that, that this shooting, the shooter had on their families, but also the response. What do you make of that? 
You know, it's very interesting. Victim impact statements are very important. They're important to the court and they're important to us to understand how these crimes affect real people, real communities. And that's what these statements did. They held people accountable, starting from the first one, Diane, with the timeline. I mean, she gave a side by side of what her day was like versus what was happening at the school, down to the responses that they felt were inadequate. I mean, it really illustrates how these effects and these actions can affect these families so very deeply. And ABC's Trevor Alt is outside court in Michigan. Trevor, going into the sentencing hearing, you had mentioned how Jennifer Crumbly's statement on the stand when she said that she wouldn't do anything differently affected her case tremendously. What do you make of now hearing her stand up in court and say, my words were misinterpreted and here's what I actually meant? I think that she's trying to unring the bell a little bit, Diane, so I think she's trying to provide some clarity, but even the way that she speaks about it isn't necessarily entirely accurate as to how this moment happened. So what originally transpired is in court, she takes the stand in her own defense, and in the course of one of her answers, she says that she's asked herself, would she do anything differently? And looking back, she would not do anything differently. Understandably, I think that did not resonate with a lot of people. It upset the family members and a lot of them uh, from what we've heard of the jury, they also took note of that too. And even the prosecution said this shows a distinct lack of remorse. What we heard from her today is that she meant without the benefit of hindsight, there was nothing else that she could have done at the time. And of course, looking back with hindsight, she would do a lot of things differently. She said that she, she also said that she was asked, would you do anything differently? To which she said, with what I knew at the time, no. That's not really how it was posed. She brought this all up herself when she was testifying on the stand. And she, she even said, I've asked myself, would I do anything differently? And the answer is no. So I don't know that that's necessarily going to have a lot of sway, especially after a, a, a morning in this sentencing hearing, Diane, where the judge was kind of rejecting every single objection in terms of sentencing recommendations that came from the defense. Uh, and also then what I took note of over those witness, uh, those impact statements is how a huge huge uh, fulcrum, basically a huge point of the defense was, as you talked about, how the defense feels that this could be any parent, that these parents had no way of knowing what their son was doing, and this could happen to anybody. To hear that juxtaposed against the parents of victims talking about what they had to go through day of identifying their children and having to tell their, the, their other children that their sibling had died and hearing their screams. And to look at those parents absolutely reject this idea that these parents uh, could be so negligent and that was just run-of-the-mill parenting that there was simply no way of knowing what was going on when they were called to the school the morning of the shooting over their son's disturbing drawings when they bought him the weapon when they had ignored text messages where he's seeing ghosts the families certainly do not buy it the prosecution doesn't buy it and we'll see whether or not the judge buys it too Shauna, there was a, another part also that stuck out to me as Jennifer Crumbly was uh, speaking when she said that she and her husband used to often say that they have the perfect kid. And she said that, you know, she was accused of not giving the school the, the full picture when they were called in for that meeting about the disturbing drawing that he had made just hours before that shooting. She says, you know, um, that, that they were said that they didn't give the school the big picture, and she's saying the school didn't give us the big picture, painting a picture of two parents who had no idea that their child was troubled at all. Do you think that could help them in this sentencing today? I don't think so. I think that when the judge looks at it in totality, what we're looking at are very clear signs and decisions that they made. I think that when we talk about these sort of remorse statements that are given to the court, the court is looking for accountability because although she made those statements, it really reflected on the school. She took no real responsibility in acknowledging or making change or even acknowledging what happened. So I think that's going to fall on deaf ears when we're talking about this particular judge. And Shauna, I want to go back to the, the point that we were discussing earlier. Some of these family members, they appear to implicate emergency responders, investigators, Oxford schools. We heard one of the victim's sisters saying that she bled out after a security guard failed to even put a tourniquet on her. And emergency responders took, I think she said, 10 minutes from after when the shooting was to, shooter was detained to provide her with care. Do you think we could see more charges come from this case? 
You know, Diane, typically when we see those types of accusations, that's something that the state attorney is looking at or should have looked at. So there is a potential if there is information that the state attorney could have potential charges, but that's something they usually look at when they're looking at the whole event. And let's remember, these families are replaying the last moments of their in of their loved ones. And so they're going to look at and examine every action because everything led up to where they were. And the lack of assistance is something that should be addressed. It is something that should be brought to the attention of the court and to others so that way there can be changes in training and what the protocol is in schools. Trevor, what do you think we can expect to see as far as these sentences go? And particularly, I want to ask what the latest is on James Crumbly's behavior, the accusations against him right now for things that he has said to the prosecutor since being incarcerated. Mm -hmm. So so to answer your first question, Diane, I would say at this point, it's probably likely that you're going to see matching sentences for James and Jennifer Crumbly, although it is possible that they could be a little bit different. Uh, I think that the fact that they're being sentenced together here at this same hearing, that they're not really splitting hairs as to the dif differences in evidence makes it likely that they will be sentenced as a couple as well. In terms of James Crumbly's jailhouse behavior, uh, what the prosecution has highlighted and what we learned during his own trial is that they essentially had to take away his ability to communicate with the outside world beyond his attorney and clergy because allegedly on phone calls while he was in jail he was making what they deemed to be threatening statements toward the prosecutor Karen McDonald where on top of using a lot of vulgar language that we can't say on television and they didn't even want to quote inside the courtroom that he talked about how uh, he felt that he was a martyr that he was promising retribution against this prosecutor that he was going to see to it that she was going to be dis barred. Now, the prosecution has taken these as very serious threats, though his defense attorney uh, has argued repeatedly that he didn't threaten any physical harm, that he was simply venting, that he feels this is a miscarriage of justice, and that he wanted to see uh, the consequences of that miscarriage of justice against the prosecutor down the road whenever he were to be released. But the fact is, this was serious enough that local authorities felt he should no longer be allowed to have these communications, and the prosecutors feel this is something that not only uh, is a serious threat against the prosecution itself, but is something that needs to be considered when you're talking about whether or not he should be released from prison and whether or not you are weighing whether he feels remorse. They've talked about whether or not these parents think they would have done anything differently, but this is a, a man who explicitly on the phone says, and even in writings to the judge over his sentencing says, I was wrongly accused and I was wrongly convicted. It certainly doesn't paint a picture of a parent who is remorseful for their actions or believes that they were in the wrong in any capacity, and that absolutely could inform the judge's decision as to how much prison time he will receive. Shauna, could those allegations impact James Crumbly's sentence here, and could that impact whether they are sentenced differently? Absolutely. Anytime there are terroristic threats made against a public official, that is something that is illegal. Um, and it is not something that is going to bode well with the judge. You know, when we're looking at this, the judge is looking to make a determination on where on the range they should be. So everything about their demeanor, how they feel about the incident, their remorse, and their actions afterwards can impact this sentencing. And that was just a terrible call that he made. And the things that he said, the judge is definitely not going to overlook. Uh, Shauna, there is no precedent here, right? This is They're the first parents to be sentenced for their child's mass shooting and for their role in that for involuntary manslaughter. So how does the judge now consider how to award these sentences? Well, the judge is going to look towards a sentencing report. She's also going to look at any mitigating factors. For instance, they have no criminal record, no previous criminal record, things of that nature she's going to look towards. She's also going to look at the crime itself, its egregious nature, who it affected. And so those are also things that she can take into consideration when looking at this sentence. The likelihood is I would be very surprised if we see anything towards the minimum or the maximum. I think it's going to be a little bit more towards the middle. All right, and it looks like James Crumbly is getting ready to speak now. Let's listen. Clarifying, the court said she cannot tell the sheriff's office. Does he have to keep talking about Yes. I was just clarifying, Your Honor. Thank you.
Before I address this court directly, I want to do something that I have never been able to do throughout this time until now. I want to say I can't imagine the pain and agony that the families, for the families that have lost their children and what they're experiencing and what they're going through. As a parent, our biggest fear is losing our child or our children. And to lose a child is unimaginable. I, my, my heart is really broken for everybody involved. I understand my words are not going to bring any comfort. I understand that they're not going to relieve any pain. And quite frankly, they probably just don't believe me. However, I really want the families of Madison Baldwin, Hannah St. Juliana, Tate Meyer, Mir, and Justin Schilling to know how truly am I, how truly sorry I am and how devastated I was when I heard what happened to them. I have cried for you and the loss of your children more times than I can count. I know your pain and loss will never go away. Part of you will be missing forever. But please know that I am truly very sorry. I am sorry for your loss as a result of what my son did. I cannot express how much I wish that I had known what was going on with him or what was going to happen because I absolutely would have done a lot of things differently. Again, my, my heart pours out to every single one of you. It really does. Judge Matthews, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna overdo a, a, a lot of things that, that that were already said. But I know the full amount of pressure that that you have on you and the responsibility that has been placed on you throughout this case. I have the utmost respect for you, and I'm simply going to ask that you sentence me in a fair and just way. You presided over my trial and heard the evidence that was presented against me. You know that what my son did, I was not aware of or that he was planning it, or that he obtained access to the firearms in my house. There was absolutely no evidence that suggested that. As my attorney has told you, I've been on lockdown for 23 hours a day. I've not been able to speak to my son since November 30th, and I have not been able to speak with my wife since December 3rd. I know that I have experienced pales in compassion to what those families who've lost their children and countless other victims experience every day because of what my son did. But I want you to know I too grieve for everyone, as I have explained, for everyone that's been affected by what my son pled guilty to doing. And I'll continue to feel this pain for the rest of my life as well. If I could go back and change things, 
if I could go back and do things differently, and maybe none of us would be here today. So again, I ask your honor to impose a just and fair sentence based on the truth about what you heard during my trial. I'm asking the court to sentence me to time served and place me on probation for the maximum time allowed with the GPS tether for as long as the court deems necessary. I also want to address one last thing. And that's to what Tate Mears' dad said. It is time that we all know the truth. We have been prohibited from telling the whole truth. The whole truth has not been told. And I'm with you, Mr. Mir. I too want the truth. Because you have not had it. You have not had the truth at all. The truth has not been presented to you. Thank you. We have been listening to James Crumbly addressing the families of the victims killed by his son during a mass shooting at his Michigan high school. James Crumbly says he's sorry for their loss as a result of what his son did, but also explained that he believes they have not been given the truth or the whole story. Jennifer and James Crumbly are the first parents ever convicted in a U.S. mass school shooting committed by their child, and now they are uh, up for sentencing, and we heard James Crumbly asking for time served plus the maximum probation available. I want to bring back ABC's Trevor Alt outside court in Michigan, along with ABC News legal contributor Shauna Lloyd for more. Uh, Trevor, interesting part there at the end where James Crumbly echoed Tate Mears' father saying, we don't have the whole truth, and he, like Tate Mears' father, wants to fight for that. What do you think he means by that, and do these men mean the same thing when they say that? I think that they don't quite mean the same thing, Diane, but I do think that there is a little bit of overlap that James Crumbly saw as an opportunity to make his own case. And what, believe, what happened earlier is that the father of one of these victims, Tate Meir, who was killed in this shooting, his father, Buck Meir, spoke and began by saying he wasn't going to waste a single second talking about the Crumbly family. That doesn't mean that he feels they're not responsible. In fact, you could tell that he had a level of contempt for the Crumbly family. What he instead talked about is that he feels that justice is not yet been fully carried out because he and many other family members that we've also heard from believe that the school district is also responsible for this shooting. And the families have repeatedly throughout this process talked about how there needs to be some accountability from the school too. Now that's accountability alongside the shooter and alongside the Crumbly parents. What James Crumbly saw was that opportunity, the argument that the full truth had not been presented and essentially said that he feels that the school is also responsible. But the difference is, of course, that he feels he is not. Now, this was very interesting to hear from James Crumbly because it's the first time that we ever heard from him in court. He did not take the stand in his own defense. Unlike his wife, he used that opening statement to address the families directly and talk about how he feels terrible for what his son did. But he did repeatedly emphasize that that his son had done it and not him, that he was not aware of what his son was going to do and had he known, he would have behaved differently. The families made it very clear that they don't necessarily buy that and the juries also don't necessarily buy that or even the fact that he did not know explicitly that his son was planning to carry out a school shooting does not excuse what in other cases was gross negligence in terms of failing to secure that firearm. But it was definitely at least a little bit of a different tone from what we've at least seen from James Crumbly, both in his writings and also from those alleged jailhouse phone calls, Diane, where he's explicitly referred to himself as a martyr and talked about he is wrongfully accused and wrongfully convicted. At the very least, this is the first time we have seen him express some kind of uh, empathy or the stating that his heart was pouring out to the victims, although he did explicitly state is for what his son did and not for what he did and did not do.
Uh, Shana, he also asked the judge for a fair and just sentence, but then specified that he believes that is time served plus the maximum amount of probation available. Do you think they'll get that? You know, Diane, I really don't think so. I know that they have no criminal background. However, I think the egregious nature of the crime, I think, is going to denote a little bit more time than what they've already served, as well as probation. Uh, Trevor, the Crumblies both say they've spent 23 hours a day in a jail cell. Jennifer called it essentially solitary confinement. What do we know about the conditions where they're being held and where they could spend whatever sentence they do get today? Yeah, so given the fact that before their convictions, they're, you're not sent to prison because you are not convicted, so you're held in jail. What we do know is that in the wake of this shooting, this was true for both James and Jennifer Crumbly and also for their son, all three of them were being held separately. So part of that is for their own protection, given the nature of the crime here, the fact that they're local and people might know uh, what or might have been impacted by what had happened. But yes, it does mean that you are going to be separated. And over the course of trials kicked back, dates uh, pushed back, appeals processes, splitting the trials up so that you have Jennifer going first and then James later. Now we're talking about two and a half years since the first shooting happened. Is that probably uncomfortable in jail? Yes, although that's kind of also part of the point. I don't know that that's necessarily going to sway the judge in any one way. Uh, if you make an argument that being in jail or being in prison is difficult, I think that they'll say, yeah, that's kind of how this was built to be, especially when both of these parents had been convicted here. So after a conviction, of course, they move to uh, a prison. It will likely be a little bit different than the, the jail conditions here in, uh, Oak, in uh, Pontiac, where we are actually not too far from this courthouse where they have been staying. Uh, but when they're just, I think that they're just simply trying to make the point that this has been already very difficult, that they have already been serving a punishment. And so while they're waiting on their sentence, it's saying, listen, we haven't been at home or you know kicking back uh, waiting to figure out what you decide we've already spent two and a half years behind bars very little time out James Crumbly very little communication to the outside world and these two parents uh, these two uh, a couple have not spoken to each other until today Diane yeah interesting to hear them say that and to see them in court together uh, today Shauna I, I want to go back to the victim impact statements because you know, we heard the, the first mom that got up there literally going through the timeline of her day and what she was doing that day at the same time as whatever the Crumblies were doing that day. We heard a sister of one of the victims, a father of one of the victims, and, and so on. How much of an impact do those words have when it comes to the judge's decision today? Well, you know, Diane, the, the thing that victim impact statements do is they provide real context about who was affected and who these people were that passed. This gives a judge a very different feel about the magnitude of the crime, because going through trial is a little bit more technical and a little more clinical. But here we got the full breadth of what this meant to the victims and their families. And so that definitely is going to have a staying impact on our judge. And so, Shana, what are you expecting when these sentences come down? I'm really looking to see what the judge is going to do. I think she's going to find an, a balance between the time served and additional time. And there's likely going to be some probational tail at the end of whatever sentence she does give down as well. Now, Trevor, the Crumbly son was sentenced to life without parole after he pleaded guilty to this attack. Where does this case go from here after James and Jennifer are sentenced? Well, there is the possibility of appeal still, both for James and Jennifer Crumbly, and also there was some discussion as to whether their son might also be uh, appealing his sentence. He did plead guilty to not only the murders, but also to a, a terroristic actions too. So this is a pretty sizable sentence that life in prison without parole. I believe he is likely looking to appeal to get the possibility of parole in the future. That was actually part of the reason why he was not going to testify in his parents trials is because he didn't want that testimony to then be used in his appeal process a little bit later. Uh, so for James and Jennifer Crumbly we get the sentence. It's possible that they will appeal it depending on the length of it but also maybe not. We haven't yet heard 
uh, from his defense attorneys as to whether they're unequivocally going to appeal. And then also hanging in the balance is what both James Crumbly and also some of the family members referred to, which is the accountability for the school. There are multiple lawsuits that are still in the works. So while the school uh, isn't going to be held criminally responsible for this school shooting, it is possible that they might be held civilly responsible. And because of these trials for James and Jennifer Crumbly, we saw multiple school officials, including the counselor that met with the parents the morning of the shooting, that saw the drawing that their son had done in which he drew the weapon they had purchased for him. He had drawn a person who was shot. He wrote, the thoughts won't stop, help me. He wrote, blood everywhere. The counselor saw that, called the parents in. Then the parents declined to take their son home. The counselors sent him back to class. They did not search his backpack. They could have and likely prevented this shooting to begin with. All of that would likely be used in a civil case against the school and against those school officials who are named. Those are still hanging in the balance here. And then of course you still have the ripple effect from an unprecedented case like this. These first parents held criminally responsible for their child's mass school shooting. Is that likely to happen in future school shootings? Certainly, depending on the context, but we could be looking at a new day in terms of how prosecutors and law enforcement approach schools, uh, school shootings in the United States, Diane. And Shauna, some have expressed surprise that we haven't heard James or Jennifer Crumbly take more responsibility and ownership over what happened even today during the sentencing hearing. But given all of those potential trials outstanding, a potential appeal, a potential civil trial and so on, can they admit to wrongdoing in the court if they want a leg to stand on? Should those cases unfold? <laughs> You know, it's an interesting point, Diane. I, I, I see where you're saying, and, and if they admit wrongdoing, yes, that is going to harm a little bit of their appeal, but they could have still expressed remorse for what happened and taken some level of responsibility for not seeing a little more clearly without crossing that line. Because we are aware that they're not gonna say anything that's gonna jeopardize their appeal or any of the other potential recourse actions that they do have. All right, and now the prosecutor speaking, let's listen. And while I understand that the, the, the negligence, the gross negligence that occurred happened before what happened in that day when he <clears throat> left that bathroom and started firing the nine millimeter and killing four kids, I understand that. But it is absolutely about what James and Jennifer did and what they didn't do and the gross negligence that caused those acts. This is what it looks like. This is what it looks like when two parents have the ability and are in the best position and have the most knowledge and need to protect other kids and they do nothing. This is what it looks like. They do nothing and then they come here today and they claim they're victims of the school, of the prosecution, of the emotional tensions of public opinion. But there were two long and rigorous and detailed trials that included multiple victims and witnesses who testified under oath with hundreds of exhibits presented to the juries with the safeguard of this court allowing what they could see and what they couldn't see. And they were defended by two attorneys aptly and vigorously that is what this conviction is about. And when fashioning a sentence, it is absolutely critical that you, that you listen and consider the impact of what that gross negligence cost. So we're asking you to exceed the guidelines because I believe all of the factors pursuant to the case law with the necessary consideration of the impact of these crimes justifies you to do. We're asking you, the people are asking you, Your Honor, to consider the devastating impact of their gross negligence that was foreseeable. Help me. Blood everywhere. The world is dead. All the while, a nine millimeter had just been purchased for him. And, and he 50 rounds of ammunition. 
Both things can be true, Your Honor. You can fashion a proportionate sentence, but not ignore the unimaginable loss and a grief that these parents, these parents are enduring. Because they will never get back another moment with Tate, or Hannah, or Justin, or Madison. And this is what it looks like. Thank you. Thank you. I guess I would like to say briefly to the families, um, considering your immeasurable grief, it's completely understandable to hate everything associated with these proceedings. I um, spent both trials looking out at all the family members, and I, I wonder to myself, I was looking straight on at Mr. S uh, St. Juliana, whether or not he'll ever smile again. And um, that's very difficult. Um, I'm very aware of, of my job in the situation, very aware of my job uh, to not be uh, swayed uh, by public opinion, by media, by any of those different things. I can't and um, will not pretend to understand the pain the families are experiencing, but I did sit through these trials with you. I saw what you saw, I heard what you heard, so I can and will offer my deepest and most sincere condolences for your unfathomable, well, unfathomable losses. It's, it's, as I just said, it's not, it's not my role, it's not the role of the court system to make an example of the defendants. However, it is a goal of sentencing to act as a deterrent. These charges are not jury edicts about gun ownership or keeping the gun in a private home. All of the jurors in both trials agreed that they understood that. Parenting is a complex job. Parenting practices around the world share the goals of ensuring health and safety, preparation for life as a productive adult, and transmission of cultural values. Parents are not expected to be psychic. But these convictions are not about poor parenting. These convictions confirm repeated acts or lack of acts that could have halted an oncoming runaway train, about repeatedly ignoring things that would make a reasonable person feel the hair on the back of their neck stand up. Opportunity knocked over and over again, louder and louder, and was ignored. No, one's, no one answered, and these two people should have and sure didn't. Mr. Crumley, it's clear to this court that because of you, there was unfettered access to a gun or guns, as well as ammunition in your home. You characterized yourself as a martyr and threatened the well-being of the prosecutor. Mrs. Crumley, you glorified the use and possession of these weapons. Your attitude toward your son and his behaviors was dispassionate and apathetic. Your response to school staff after a 12-minute meeting was, are we done here? During your trial, you announced that you wouldn't do anything different. I understand that that might have been uh, misinterpreted, but it did cut the victims deep. Because of both of your actions and inaction, among many, many other things, the world is missing out on a top uh, the world is missing out on, and a top college university will meet out, meet, miss, miss out on Tate's stark quality football skills. Um, I, I met Raina, who's wise beyond her years, and she's told us that among many, many other things, the community will be denied Hannah's kindness, creativity, and sense of humor. Among many, many other things, the world will miss is Madison's kind and loving soul and the light that reflected her beauty both inside and out. Although a hero in death because of his organ donations that helped so many, we will never know where Justin, an excellent student with vast skills and interests, described as a mentor and a leader, would have left his giant imprint. The impact statements given here and the written statements provided to the court describe the cataclysmic impact the deaths of these children have had on their children. 
With regard uh, to each defendant, um, this court uh, has spent night and day thinking about this case, as you can imagine. I've prayed about this case, I've thought about this case, and I've considered the possibility for rehabilitation, the need to protect society, the penalty appropriate to the conduct and goal of deterring others from similar, similar conduct. I, I have reviewed the pre-sentence investigation reports. I am, of course, sadly familiar with the facts and circumstances of these cases, as well as those surrounding each defendant. The advisory sen sentencing guidelines in this matter do not capture the catastrophic impact of the acts or inaction in, the, in these matters. The guidelines do not take into account the complete lack of insight both defendants have for their behavior to this very day. The guidelines do not account for the severe, severity of the circumstances in this matter. The guidelines ignore the survivors, including shooting victims, Phoebe Arthur, Elijah Mueller, Riley Franz, Kylie Osage, John Asciutto, Molly Darnell, and Aiden Watson. They were deeply wounded, both physically and emotionally. In addition to the seven wounded, each of the defendants' gross negligence has caused unimaginable suffering to hundreds of others as a result of what happened that day. Each act or inaction created a ripple effect. Therefore, an out-of-guidelines sentence is appropriate and proportional. The court uses the useful, useful tool of the legislative guidelines, which embody the, the principles of proportionality, while also taking into account the nature of the offense and the background of each defendant. I believe that the following sentences would be in the best interest of justice and are reasonable and proportionate to the seriousness of the matter and the circumstances surrounding each defendant. With regard to Jennifer Crumley, it is the sentence of this court, Ms. Crumley, that you serve 10 to 15 years with the Michigan Department of Corrections. You will have credit for 858 days. State costs are $272. as a crime victim's rights fee of $130. Um, you and your agents may not have any contact with fam the families of Madison Baldwin, Tate Meir, Hannah St. Juliana, and Justin Schilling. Um, I will issue another ruling with regard to contact um, with your son, the shooter. <coughs> Excuse me. As, defend as to defendant James Crumley, it is the sentence of this court that you serve 10 to 15 years with the Michigan Dep Department of Corrections that you receive credit for 858 days, that you pay state costs in the matter of uh, $272, that there is a crime victim's rights fee of $130, that you or your agents have no contact with the families of Madison Baldwin, Tate Muir, Hannah St. Saint Juliana, and uh, Justin Schilling. Um, Ms. Wheeler, have I left anything out with regard to sentencing? No restitution has been um, requested by any of the families at this time, correct? That's correct. Thank you. Um, I would like to advise both defendants that you are entitled to appellate review of your conviction and sentence, including that the sentence ex exceeds the guideline range. This is done by filing a claim of appeal by right, or when, you're, or when you are not entitled to file a claim of appeal by right, an application for leave to appeal. If you cannot afford to hire an attorney to represent you on appeal, and you request an attorney, an attorney may be appointed for you. You may request an attorney by completing the request for appointment of attorney section of the form that will be provided for you and by returning the form to this court or to the Michigan Assigned Counsel System at the address on the form. If you wish to preserve your automatic right to appeal, the form must be received within 42 days after sentencing. If you do not submit the form within 42 days from today, you may still file an application for leave to appeal if the form is received within six months after sentencing. Um, do each of the defendants acknowledge receipt of their appellate rights? James acknowledges receipt, Your Honor. He's completing the form as we speak. Your Honor, my client is as well. Is the, would the court like the forms here? Or would you prefer us to? It, it doesn't matter either way. Okay. Either way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask that everyone remain seated while the defendants are taken out of the courtroom. Um, I think they're going to uh, finish their assault plans. They are going to, Mr. Crumley is going to finish his part, Your right. we'll, Honor. We'll wait for that. Thank you, Your Honor. Yeah. Thank you.
I would just ask that no one, no one stand up. It makes the deputies nervous. You're watching a Michigan courtroom where the judge has just sentenced the parents of a Michigan school shooter to 10 to 15 years in prison for their roles in their son's attack. The judge said she thought and prayed about this case and reviewed the guidelines, but those guidelines, she says, did not take into account the deep emotional wounds and suffering that stemmed from the attack, nor the effect the attack had on the wounded and the ripple effects beyond that. I want to bring back ABC's Trevor Alt outside that court in Michigan, along with ABC News legal contributor Shauna Lloyd for more. Uh, Trevor, I want to start with just the historic nature of this case. These are the first parents ever convicted in a school shooting committed by their son, and now we have their sentences going beyond the guidelines, the judge saying 10 to 15 years each. What do you think? Well, I, it's absolutely not a slap on the wrist. That is absolutely my first reaction, Diane. This is a very serious sentence for what the judge clearly believes were very serious crimes that impacted not just those four students who were killed, but as she stressed, all of those four students' families, all of the many wounded in the school, and the thousands more in the community beyond it. So this is clearly in the judge's eyes, uh, not just a historic conviction, but also a correct conviction. And we heard her detail uh, why she felt these parents were so irresponsible in buying that weapon and celebrating that they had purchased a weapon for their son as he was showing all these red flags for his mental health, failing to secure the gun. She, she accused Jennifer Crumbly of being apathetic to her son and how her son's mental health and failing to take him from home from school that very morning here. So not only does the judge feel that the, uh, the sentence is correct, but also she agreed with the prosecution's recommendation. They had asked for 10 to 15 years and they got 10 to 15 years. And just to give some clarity here in terms of the guidelines that the judge is referring to. So involuntary manslaughter in the state of Michigan carries a maximum penalty of 15 years in prison. But there are general guidelines as to what the sentence might be. Obviously, not all cases are going to be the most extreme of 15 years. Some will uh, warrant a penalty far less than that. Generally, the recommendation is a maximum of about seven years. Now, in those cases where it seems to be a bit more extreme, the judge has that authority to go much further. And she said this one seems very clearly to be an extreme case to exceed those guidelines. So now, with the sentence of 10 to 15 years, that means at a minimum now, James and Jennifer Crumbly are going to be looking at being in prison until late 2031, 10 years after their son committed this heinous act. They expressed uh, their condolences to the family for the, the families of the students that their son killed. But now they are the first American parents who are also going to pay for their role, not only for uh, being necessarily bad parents, as the judge had said, not for being bad gun owners, but for being criminally responsible for the deaths of these four students, Diane. And, and Shauna, when the judge says 10 to 15 years, what does that mean? What now determines whether it's 10 or 15 or somewhere in between? What's going to happen is they're going to go before the parole board. They will set that, and then they will also receive, there is time um, for good behavior and other things that can also keep that closer to the 10 as opposed to the 15. And, and Shauna, the judge opened almost immediately when she said she went on to why she found them culpable and why she found that they earned the sentence. And she said opportunity knocked louder and louder and was ignored. What did you make of that moment? You know, I think this was the judge really looking at each instance that she felt that they could have made a different choice and that they ignored it. And to her, that showed that the totality of this really could have been stopped by the parent and that it was not. And therefore, she felt that that warranted the sentence because it wasn't one particular incident. It was a series of incidents that led up to this that they could have made changes and they chose not to. Trevor, she also brought up that meeting that the Crumbleys had in the school that day, that they were called in by a counselor because of this disturbing drawing that their son has, had made. And they had this 15-minute this me meeting, and she quoted Jennifer Crumbly as saying, are we done here? After those, you know, 15 minutes or whatever it was for that meeting. How much did that meeting, just hours before the shooting, impact not only their cases where they both got convicted, but now their sentencing as well? I mean, I think it was critical, Diane, because it speaks to uh, beyond the fact that they had purchased the weapon for their son or they had not necessarily been responsive to his mental health. I mean, this was about as close as you could get to a cry for help when you have your son 
called in for an emergency meeting to the point that we know Jennifer Crumbly texted her husband James, all caps, emergency about this drawing in which he had drawn the gun that they bought him and a person who had been shot and was bleeding and rode out along with the thoughts won't stop and blood everywhere. He rode out, help me. And according to the school officials who testified, while the parents showed up, this was a very brief meeting. They did not ask very many questions. They seemed a little apathetic, according to those school officials. And then concluding it, yes, with not only are they, not only we're not taking our son home because Jennifer Crumbly said she needed to get back to work, and so did James, even though Jennifer's boss said she did not need to get back to work. And James worked as a DoorDash delivery driver, so he set his own hours and could have taken his son with him. But Jennifer Crumbly saying, "Are we done here?" speaks to that apathy that the judge referred to, where it seemed that these parents not only were they perhaps oblivious to their son's red flags, but they also didn't even necessarily care about them. And for that to happen less than two hours before this school shooting happened, it not only paints to the fact um, that they were ignoring all of those signs, but it was top of mind to the point that when they learned a shooting had happened, those two hours later, Jennifer texted her son, Ethan, don't do it. And James Crumbly, shortly after, raced home to check to see if the weapon was still there. So certainly there was enough to put it in their mind that their son was capable of this when they learned that a shooting had happened. Whether or not they're ever going to admit that they realized this was a possibility, I don't know that we'll ever see the day. Perhaps we will see an appeal. Uh, but clearly this judge was swayed by the arguments of the prosecution that these parents were grossly negligent, not just once, but over and over again, leading to this shooting. Shauna, that said, we did hear during their trials and today during Jennifer Crumbly's statement that the school asked them if they were going to take their son home, but didn't tell them they had to take their son home. And Jennifer Crumbly saying the school said he was not a threat at that time. So could this all open the door for more charges or other impacts against school officials here? You know, I think what we're going to see, Diane, is really going to be civil cases against the school. Their lack of preparation, training, or addressing the situation at the time. I think we will see a lot of civil suits come out of this against the school. I don't see it likely rising to a criminal level, but there will absolutely be lawsuits in the civil arena from the parents against the schools in the actions that they took in releasing him back to the students, potentially not having him searched at the time. Those things are going to definitely definitely warrant that type of uh, litigation. And Shauna, we saw two first of their kind cases, now a first of its kind sentencing. What kind of a precedent does this set, 10 to 15 years for each of them? I mean, this 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 sentencing really set a standard, and this judge was very clear about what she saw and why it warranted this level of a sentence. Now, let's remember, Michigan does have a very specific statute that gives parents a duty to require them to not have their children injure others. Not every state has this statute, so I don't know that we're going to see wide-sweeping charges in these school shootings. However, what we might see is additional legislation to put this on the books. This may be something that legislation legislators want to look at to make sure that other parents can be held accountable when it is a crime and that it's this egregious. So Trevor, what are the next steps? Well, the next step is that James and Jennifer Crumbly are going to be heading to a state facility. It's possible that they will then play out uh, the appeals process. We'll have to see what their defense attorneys decide they want to do, whether appealing the conviction or appealing the sentence. You also have their son, who's facing life in prison without the possibility of parole, potentially appealing his sentence as well. So they may uh, use the fact that his parents have now been convicted for being grossly negligent as reason for him to argue that he did not necessarily have as well. He didn't get the help that he needed or that he had. Uh, if his parents were criminally irresponsible, then perhaps that should be considered with his own sentencing for his own crimes. And then playing out over all of this is those civil lawsuits against the school. You heard from some of the parents in their impact statements today talking about how they want even more accountability. They want investigations from the government, but specifically specifically already in motion are multiple lawsuits, some of them uh, for millions of dollars against the school and the school officials who testified in 
James and Jennifer Crumbly's trial in which they admitted under oath that they did not consider the shooter to be a threat to other students just hours before he killed those four students. That's going to be the next step in this case and the parents of these victims while they are very satisfied to have these convictions and the prosecution is very satisfied to have these convictions. They have said from the beginning they are not done here. They want the school to be held accountable too. All right, Trevor Alt, Shauna Lloyd, thank you both. And we have more breaking news. An appeals court has denied a last-ditch effort from former President Trump to delay his hush money trial set to begin next week. The court will consider whether to relax the gag order the judge imposed on Trump. We'll have much more on the decision and what it means for the trial of former President Trump throughout the day. We'll be right back. Whenever news breaks... We are here in Israel, a nation at war, after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yeah with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Beyonce's conquering country. My family loves Beyonce. Cowboy Carter comes into the world at a very complex time. People are saying, this song is too good to resist. Just because you sing hip-hop music with a country accent does not make it country music. The stay in your lane, the, well, that's not real country. It takes somebody who is at superstar status to do something that shakes it all up. It's Beyonce country. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. Here's to good mornings in America. Can you feel the love? <laughs> oh, yeah. Mornings that inspire, filled with hope, kindness, joyous surprises, and so